The meeting will come to order. To avoid disruptions in our meeting and in respect to all the attendees of this International Board of Trustees meeting, the chair requires that all cell phones be turned off or silenced. If you must answer a cell phone, do outside of the room in which you are currently seated for the same reason. Please also be aware of any background noise, no matter how insignificant it may advertly be transmitted during the meeting and cause a disruption. As this meeting is being broadcast live on Zoom and recorded to be posted to YouTube later, please make sure that it is an appropriate background visible for the audience on the Zoom call people. Due to the COVID-19 related travel restrictions, this hybrid meeting will be held online by a broadcast Zoom meeting. Any other recording transmittals or retransmittals of this International Board of Trustees meeting is not authorized. Any violation of this policy may, may be subjected to legal and or disciplinary measures. The proprietary rights of our corporation and our members need to be respected. For the start of this meeting, we'll have a moment of silence. Thank you. Please raise for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, led by International First Vice President Eric McKenzie. Eric, please begin. <laughs> Just get out me. I forgot. I got the exact text. So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Please be seated. At the June 30th, 2018 meeting of the International Board of Trustees, the bylaws, Article 8, Section 3 was amended to read, the proprietary seminar and IBT meetings may be combined for each of the three boards of trustees meetings. The seminar and the IBT meeting have been combined for today. Proposed rules for this hybrid meeting are, any member may speak during this meeting after being recognized by the chair. Members who will have a chance to be heard, all speakers must give their name and office. Remarks are to be limited to three minutes except for approved by the chair. Board members are to mute their microphones until recognized by the chair. Board members who want to ask a question or make a comment are to use the raised hand tool provided on the Zoom. Zoom should remain muted until called upon by the chair. Once recognized by the chair, board members are to unmute their microphones, present a question slash comment and mute their microphones again when they have finished talking. In lieu of an in-person participation, members are able to submit questions or comments to the IBT through an online form, voicemail or email. Forms, voicemails and emails need to be submitted before the start of the meeting and were distributed by the, to the IBT. They will be addressed during the appropriate discussion. After each updated report or action item is presented, feedback will be requested from the International Board of Trustees, followed by the Region Vice Presidents. If there are not any questions or comments for the in-person audience or the Zoom audience, discussion will end when the chair calls for the question and all raised hands will be lowered. Speakers may speak twice on each item, but those who wish to speak a second time must wait until all who want to speak a first time have done so. A yellow card, <coughs> Get this, will be held up when the speakers have spoken for two minutes. When three minutes have been used by the speaker, a red card will be held up. As the bell will ring, the speaker will stop. There will be a limit of 20 minutes for discussions on each motion unless the chair extends the time. If a roll call vote is necessary, the International Recording Secretary will randomly call on board members. Microphones will be unmuted to record the vote and then muted again once the vote is completed. When the chair calls for the question, only the trustees may vote. If there is no objection, these will be the rules of this meeting. Hearing no objections, these are the rules for this meeting. The secretary will call the roll. President Ty Mott. Present. First Vice President Eric McHenry. Present. Second Vice President Per Hamquist. Present. Third Vice President Karen Fisher. 
Present. Recording Secretary Linda Shelton. Present. Treasurer Trevor Lake. Immediate past president, Andrew Selking. Present. Region one president, Doug Hart. Present. Region two president, RJ Marquette. Present. Region three president, Bill Wild. Present. Region four president, Brad Briggs. Present. Region five president, Christopher Seplak. Present. Region six president, Larry Madden. Present. Region seven president, Jane Carmichael. Present. Region eight president, Greg Badner. Present. Region nine president, Bill Miller. Present. Region 10 president, Kathy Giese. Present. Region 11 president, Ken Johansson. Present. Region 12 president, Laverne McHenry. Present. Parliamentarian Joanne Miller. Present. Corporate manager Lori Plummer. Present. Trustee Justin Humphreys. Present. We have 20 present. Thank you, Linda. The quorum is present. A, a proposed agenda for this meeting is before you. Without objection, this will be the agenda. Hearing no objection, this will be the agenda for this meeting. The minutes of July 24, 2021, IBT hybrid meeting have been distributed electronically to the members of this board. Without objection, we shall dispense with the reading of the minutes. Hearing none, we will dispense with the reading of the minutes. Are there any corrections to these minutes? Since there are no corrections, the minutes are approved as distributed. Next item on the agenda is report of the officers. First, the president's report. I just wanna thank everybody for being here. We've had a great turnout. And last time I heard we were about 80 trailers. Is that right, John? 78 rigs here. So we've had a really good turnout. That's all I have to say today. Everybody enjoy your meal tonight and thank you for being here. Are there any other reports of the officers? Eric? Uh, okay. Next will be a report from Eric McHenry, first vice president. Uh, first, I just have to say thanks to John and the team. Uh, this has been wonderful. I uh, share the same feeling of it's really good to get back together. You know, it's why we're in the club, to get back together with our friends and explore new places. So Laverne and I hope to get into Savannah uh, before we leave, but but thank you. I know it's a huge effort. Um, you know, I would just want to share briefly, and I will be sharing more information to the deck committee and then later to the board on the status of the website. And the international and the database, including the national rally database. As many of you are aware, I continue to be the project manager uh, for our uh, database and our website. <laughs> Corporate manager may talk about it as well. I'm pleased to say some things are going great. There's a lot of things that need improvement. We're very aware of that. Um, we are in a phase now, finally, where things, look at Lori before I say this, are <laughs> becoming stable on the back end side. <laughs> And by stable, I mean the data in there is generally correct. And one of the problems that any organization has when they migrate system is that the data that comes across, in this case, member information, what caravans you've been on, what leadership positions you have, what's your phone number, what's your email. And the information that comes across from the system we have before to the new system, invariably there's cleanup. And we've gotten to a point now through this last renewal phase we're, we're much better off. And uh, Lori can speak some more about the renewal process, but it actually went relatively well from the member side. There was issues from the back end side. The next thing for us, um, to my uh, peer to my right, uh, is really helping out this thought process. We need to do a better job showing the board what the financial 
obligations and commitments and the financial planning structure is for our technology, right? It's not free, as you all know. It feels like every day we get a quote for $750 for this, a thousand for that. And we need help prioritizing what our club wants to do next that meets our members' needs next. And that's something that Pear is going to help with with his uh, particular technology background also. So we can present you guys with a really good set of this is what it's going to cost to this. And you may tell us, you know, we really want to prioritize this over that, or we don't think that's important to our members, or what about this? So um, kudos to all of the local clubs and regions for um, the patience as we've navigated this. Uh, uh, the next big test for it will be the International Rally um, Database, which is title worry. It's, it's looking good. <laughs> We're good on that. But, um, but thank you for your help and uh, support on, on the technology bits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. That's it for me. Thank you, Eric. Perry Hamquist, second vice president, will report next. Uh, let me say that it has been an honor to serve the members of this club. It means a lot to me as personally and for my wife as well. Um, this year, um, has, uh, one of my focuses has been on trying to identify a site for the International Rally in 2024, and that's going well. We're pursuing three potential locations. I mean, I'm reveal where they are, but let's just say that we are, we are pursuing them in parallel. Uh, and I'm glad I am because they are different. So. Um, I'm also inspired by the sense of growing respect among the members at the IBT level for differing opinions on sensitive topics, um, including COVID-19. Uh, you know, we fall on two different sides of the fence on some of these sensitive topics, and I'm happy to see that people can listen to each other and consider that as we look for options to you know, support the big uh, group of local clubs that we have out there. They're not all the same. And it's been even more visible to me that, you know, we call ourselves the club, but we are actually a lot of little clubs with a branding umbrella top. So thanks. Uh, looking forward to another year. Uh, interesting work. Thank you, Perry. Next will be a report from Karen Fisher, third vice president. I just want to add my thanks um, to John and his team for the great rally here and all the work that I know they put into it. Um, I'm enjoying being on the EC and learning a lot about how things operate and look forward to continuing to serve the club. Thank you, Karen. Andy Selking, immediate past president, will report next. Thank you very much. The report over the Ed and I are happy that we're here. Thank you, Andy. At this time, I would like to ask if there's any additional reports from Lori Palmer, corporate manager. Thanks, Ty. Um, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm I'm freezing, so if I'm chattering, that's why. <laughs> Boy, I. So I just wanted to uh, touch on membership. Uh, this last year or so has been phenomenal, um, and I also, first of all, uh, thank John and, and Region Three for having us. I also want to make sure we thank our team at HQ. Our team there does a, an amazing job of of working through all these memberships and things that we're doing. So I wanna share a quick graphic um, just to give you guys an idea of membership. There we go. So if you guys can see, nope. <laughs> you can't read it, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, you can't read it, I know it's small, but this is the graphic, I wanted you to see that line. Um, so as I mentioned, when we ended 2021, we had 8,954 memberships. And I, it gives me goosebumps. And I just appreciate um, all the clubs, everybody bringing these folks in. To give, um, last time we had, we just beat the 2002 membership record. So um, the very first dot on this line, if you guys can see it, is 2001. So if that just gives you an idea what has happened over the last 20 years, I think it's fantastic. 
Um, and again, just wanting to share that um, with you all. I also want to share maybe if I can function with my um, machine here that of course it's not, yeah, there it is, it's not answering me. Um, the other thing that uh, again, just want to give a visual on is our join process. Again, Amanda, um, Amanda came to us and I hope you're listening because I'm gonna pick on you for a second. <laughs> She came to us in 2019 and both Barb and I said to her, oh, there's a slow period. I promise there's a slow period. <laughs> I got to eat a little bit of crow because there hasn't been a slow period. So as you can see, the blue um, towers on this graphic is 2019, orange is 2020, and the gray is 2021. Oh. So that's been our join rate. And I'll share this and get this posted to everybody, but I thought a visual was nice for everybody to see on our membership. So that's all I have to share right now. Thank you, Lori. I want to thank Justin Humphreys, if he's still listening, for his report earlier this morning. We appreciate you joining us from the uh, trailer show. Is there any correspondence to be read? No, sir. May we have the treasurer's report? Ms. Trevor is having computer problems. Linda will read the report. I'll be patient. I haven't read big numbers like this in a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Treasurer's report includes the period of August 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2021. Income, $1,500,244. Expenses, $755,300. Net income, 744,943. Assets, checking and savings, 828,485. Investments, 414,639. Common sense for kids, 19,230. Lifetime accounts, 118,347. Accounts receivables and other current assets, 91,271. Total current assets, 1,471,972. Fixed assets, less depre de 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 depreciation. Got it. <laughs> 187,758. Total assets. 1,659,730. Total current liabilities, 140,319. Total equity, 1,519,411. Total liabilities and equity, 1,659,730. Trevor Lake, International Treasurer. Thank you, Linda. Are there any questions on the treasurer's report? Are there any questions on the treasurer's report? From the board? From the region vice presidents? The treasurer's report will be filed. Next will be the executive committee meeting report. This is the recap of the executive, not on. Just pull it a little closer to you. How's it? How about now? How about now? <laughs> uh, recap of the executive committee meetings and votes from July 27th, 2021 through December 1st, 2021. Members who attended the following meetings were President Ty Mosh, First Vice President Eric McHenry, Second Vice President Per Hamquist, Third Vice President Karen Fisher, Immediate Past President Andrew Samkin, Treasurer Trevor Lake, Recording Secretary Linda Shelton, Parliamentarian Joanne Miller, Corporate Manager Lori Plummer. October 6, 2021, Motion 2101, made by Eric McHenry and seconded by Per Hamquist to approve the provisional part charter of the Grapes and Grains Intra Club. Motion carried unanimously. November 3rd, 
motion 2102R1 made by Pear Hamquist and seconded by Karen Fisher to approve the new logo and flag for the Washington DC unit. Motion carried unanimously. Motion 2103R1 made by Pear Hamquist and seconded by Karen Fisher to approve the name change of the Keystone Pennsylvania Airstream Club. Motion carried unanimously. Motion 2104 made by Eric McHenry and seconded by Trevor Lake to approve the provisional charter for the future streamers entry club. Motion carried unanimously. After discussing many issues with the Europe charter, it was decided that a letter of suspension along with what needs to be done to get the suspension field lifted would be sent by President Tom Hall. After consulting with Tom Smithson on the correct procedure for the letter, the letter of suspension of charter and next steps to get back on track were sent to the Europe members on December 15, 2021. November 15, 2021, motion 2105 made by Pear Hanquist and seconded by Trevor Lake to approve the name change of the North Texas unit to North Texas Airstream Club. Motion carried unanimously. December 1st, 2021, motion 2106 made by Pear Hanquist and seconded by Karen Fisher to approve the logo design of the North Texas Airstream Club. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Linda. The next order of business is that of the Standing Committee and Special Committee reports. All members of this board have received electronic copies of the written report and action items filled by each committee. The order of the Standing Committee reports is listed in the bylaws, Article 3, Section 1. For those watching, these reports and motions are on airstreamclub.org slash IBT, where you can refer to them. We will begin with the Standing Committee report. Some committee reports include action items which will be presented with the committee report. I would like to introduce Joanne uh, Miller as a parliamentarian to explain the process for amending motions. During the discussion in the last couple of days, it was decided that it would be okay or preferable that some of these motions may be amended during this meeting. And so this is going to probably be a learning process for those of us that are sitting here on the board and we will gladly work you through those steps. So don't panic if you want something to amend. So you'll be voting on a few motions today. Each motion will be introduced and read by the motion maker. Unless the motion is from a committee, the motion will need to be seconded before it can be discussed. After a motion has been made and before the question has been stated by the chair, any member can quickly rise and with little or no explanatory comment, informally suggest one or more modifications to the motion. This would be the friendly amendments that were discussed yesterday. At this point, the maker of the motion can accept or reject the suggestion as he or she wishes. And this method should be generally limited to minor changes about which there's likely, unlikely to be a difference of opinion. If you would like to propose a change in the wording of the motion you are voting on, you can make a motion to amend the original motion after the chair recognizes you. And this would be after it has been presented by the chair. The motion may be amended by striking out words, inserting or adding words, striking out words and inserting others in their place, or substituting one paragraph for another. When you have been recognized by the chair, you may say, I move to amend the motion by, and then you would say striking out such and such or inserting these words, okay? Another member can say while the amendment is pending that if it is voted down, he or she will offer another amendment which he or she can then briefly explain in that discussion. So for example, um, I'm gonna, use a couple of examples here. If, if the president from region three 
had an amendment that he would like considered. And he shared that amendment with the group. And the president from region five says, wait a second, if you turn that amendment down, this is an amendment I would like to propose in its place. And so then they can discuss the two and decide, okay, do we want the, the amendment from region three president or would we prefer the, the amendment from the region five president? And through discussion, we would decide which amendment they wanted. The amendment will need to be seconded before discussion begins on it. And the amendment, if there isn't an amendment to the motion, the amendment will be voted on before the vote is taken on the original motion. If the amendment is approved or adopted, then the vote will be on the, mo the original motion as amended. If it is not, if the amendment is not approved, then we will just go on to vote on the original motion as it stands without any amendments. Okay. Now I know that sounds confusing. This is something that we have done in the past when we've had the seminar separate from the IBT. We're now trying to show people what's going on, that it's not all taking place behind the scenes. And we will be working through this process with you. So please, if you have an amendment that you want to present, present it. We'll work, I will help you work through the steps, okay? Thank you, Joanna. We will be, as directed by policy 8.6.1, section E, IBT votes are to be by roll call unless a request for unanimous consent is approved. The chair will put the question for unanimous consent on all motions after discussion is complete. If there is an objection to an unanimous consent, a roll call vote will be taken. After a motion has been passed, headquarters will make the appropriate changes to the blue book and distribute them. Is a report from the Budget and Standing Committee. From the Budget Standing Committee. Okay. John Becker, Caravan Standing Committee Chair, you have the committee's report. Are there any additions to this report? Uh, John Becker, I'm the chair for the Caravan Committee. I, yeah, I do have some additions. Uh, in, in my report on the second page, I mentioned that Gary and Rosemary Anderson, as well as Ray and Carol Combs qualified for 800 numbers in this past year. Uh, also, Judy and Peter Schwartz, uh, leaders of Cajun and will be leaders in Alaska on the alternate years uh, with the Hackneys, uh, have also qualified. So when you do see them, they'll be number 888, which is the number my Chinese friends would have picked. <laughs> and uh, so when you do see them, please give them your thanks uh, because they've done a great service to the club uh, by leading caravans. And, and as, I, as I mentioned in my report, uh, the, the Andersons and also the Combs continue to do a good job on formal and informal training and mentoring. Also, we're up to 24 national caravans for next year. I inadvertently left off rolling to the Big Easy. Uh, I'd also like to add that we have some newly trained leaders. We'll be co-leaders. The Ed and Joni Hall will be co-leaders on Smidge of the Blue Ridge next year. Uh, and we will have two numbered local caravans going to international. Um, so that means they'll meet the requirements of using the kitty fee method. Uh, they're also eligible for from the caravan fund to get some advanced funds to make deposits, which way they will then return uh, once the caravan runs. So those are the additions to my report. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, John. Are there any questions from the board? Jane Carmichael, Region 7 President. Question for those who don't know how you get an 800 number. How many caravans do they lead as uh, to, to qualify? After leading five national caravans, you qualify for the 800 number. Okay. Any questions from the region vice presidents? From the audience? Thank you, John. We appreciate it. Thank you. Your time. Constitution and Bylaw Standing Committee, Chair Tom Smithson. 
You have the written committee's report. Are there any additions to the report, Tom? Tom Smithson, CBL Chair. Um, Mr. President, the only addition I would make is that the numbers of- Tom, can you turn your mic on? In? Turn it on. Turn it on. Oh. All right, uh, thank you, Tom Smithson, CBL Chair. Uh, the only addition to the report is that uh, my listing of the number of clubs who are out of compliance with their annual or their five-year review is now somewhat shorter. Um, a number of them, since the report was written, have submitted the necessary documentation. Thank you. Any additions? Any questions from the board? Region vice presidents? From the audience. There are two action items presented with this report. Tom, will you please read motion A-R-1 entitled, Deletions of Constitutional Delegates Meetings from the WBCCI Constitution. Thank you, Mr. President. Motion that, <laughs> summary of this motion is the motion deletes WBCCI Constitution Article 11 Constitutional Delegates Meeting and all references to Constitutional Delegates Meeting in WBCCI Constitution Article 10, Club Organization. Further delete WBCCI Constitution Article 14 amendments and insert a new Article 14 amendments as well as renumbering the remaining WBCCI Constitution articles to reflect these changes. Motion is, I move that the International Board of Trustees submit to the membership the following amendment to the WBCCI Constitution. Delete in its entirety Article 11 Constitutional Delegates Meeting. Further, that the reference to constitutional delegates meeting in WBCCI Constitution Article 10, Club Organization Section 2, and insert for any amendments to the WBCCI Constitution. Further, delete WBCCI Constitution Article 14 amendments in its entirety and insert a new Article 14 amendments and renumber the remaining articles of the Constitution. This is a motion from the committee and does not require a second. Please read your proposed impact, background, and financial impact statements. Sure. And impact. The purpose of this motion is to establish a new method for amending the WCCI Constitution by removing the requirement for a delegate from the international rally and establishing in policy a new method for amendment. The impact of this motion will be to provide a more expeditious, expeditious way to amend the WBCCI Constitution, as well as free up time at the International Rally for more educational and social activities. In addition, it will provide the opportunity for all members to directly contribute to the perfection of any proposed amendments. Background. In the history of WBCCI, amendments to the Constitution have been a drawn out process with proposals going to the International Board of Trustees, and if approved, submitted to the Constitution Bylaws Committee for review. Following the review, the proposed amendments would be sent to local clubs for their consideration and a club vote on the proposal. The vote would then be carried to the International Rally Delegates Meeting for reporting by a local club delegate. In addition, the opportunity to amend any motion was only available at a delegates meeting, further drawing out the process. Are there any questions or discussions concerning this motion? Oh, financial impact. I'm sorry, Tom, I cut you short. Just a little. <laughs> financial impact. There is a positive financial impact in removing any expenses associated with the delegate meeting from the international rally. Thank you. Are there any questions or discussions concerning this motion from the board? From the region vice presidents? the audience. Oh. Have one online. Got one online? Yes. Okay. Unmute. Good morning. This is Gail Harrower calling Alberta Saskatchewan unit, past international treasurer. I have a question for Mr. Smithson. The financial impact you stated says that by removing um, the delegates meeting that you will re 
uh, remove any expenses associated with it. From my understanding, this was done back in 2016 or 2017, that the cost of the delegates meeting was borne by the club as a whole and not by the international rally. Is that still correct? That is correct. So then there is no financial impact. There is no financial impact to the rally, the international rally, in so much as that is self-funding. However, anything associated with the delegates meeting was funded by uh, headquarters. Correct. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on my mind? Okay. Karen? Karen Fisher, International Third Vice President. At what point do we read the proviso attached to this motion? Who's beeping for one thing? Okay. Um, then you should read the proviso. Sorry, I, I didn't. You should read the proviso? Yes, I will. Okay. Not Joanne has it. <laughs> um, I believe that the, provi the proviso to this is that, that if the motion were, were to be passed by the delegates of the next international rally that the there is a policy statement which uh, will be submitted which details out uh, the entire method by which uh, amendments of the constitution will be handled may i help may i help you yes thank you <laughs> policy 18.1.1 Will provide the procedure for consideration and approval of constitutional amendments. Thank you very much. This is my frustration of not having my instrument, which has a printer in it, having to work off of my head. Computers and copies, and it doesn't work that well. Any other questions? Motion requires a majority vote in the affirmative to pass. Or propose ordering to the Constitution Gallows in July 2022 a constitutional amendment in Article 11, Constitution Gallows, Article 10, Club Organization, and Article 14 amendments, and insert a new Article 14 and renumber the remaining constitutional art articles. Are you ready for the question? The vote is on motion A-R1 as read. Without objection, motion A-R1 as read will be approved. Hearing no objection, motion A-R1 is approved and will be forwarded to the membership. Okay. Tom, will you please read motion B entitled Motion Due Date to Headquarters for Publication? Thank you, Mr. Spurman. Motion Due Date to Headquarters for Publication. Summary This motion simplifies the timeline for international board of trustees agenda items to be submitted to headquarters. Motion I move in WBCC bylaws article 8, Board of Trustees, Section 3, and Section 4, Parts A through C, be deleted, and a new Section 3 be inserted. In Section 4, insert a new Part A and re-letter Part D. This motion is from a committee and does not require a second. Please read your proposed impact, background, and financial impact statement. Purpose and impact. This motion clarifies the submission timeline for reports and motions to be submitted as agenda items for any International Board of Trustees meeting. The impact is to provide agendas that reflect the content of any meeting in a timely manner. Background. Previously, there were multiple dates or timelines for submission of agenda items leading to conflicts with headquarters. To clarify this, a single timeline is established by this motion. Financial impact, there is no financial impact to WBCC. Are there any questions or discussions concerning this motion from the board? Regent Vice Presidents? From the audience. 
This is a bylaw amendment and requires a two third vote in the affirmative to pass. The motion proposed deleting bylaws Article 8, Board of Trustees, Section 3, and Section 4, Parts A through C, inserting a new Section 3, inserting a new Section 4, Part A, and relettering Part D. Are you ready for the question? The vote is on a motion number B as read. Without objection, motion B as read will be approved. Hearing no objection, motion B is approved. Thank you, Tom. You may be seated. Thank you. Bob Caldwell, Ethics and Grievance Standing Committee Chair. Have you you have the committee's report? Are there any additions to the report, Bob? No, I don't see him. Okay. Yeah, he uh, is online. There, there are no additions to my report. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions from the board? Region vice presidents? Audience? Thank you, Bob, for joining us by Zoom today. Thank you. Joe Polinski, Historical Standing Committee Chair. You have the committee's report. Are there any additions to this report? Uh, uh, Joe Polinski, uh, Historical Committee Standing uh, Standing Committee Chair. There are no uh, additions or corrections to my report. Thank you, Joe. Are there any questions from the board? Region Vice Presidents? Audience, thank you, Joe, for joining us by Zoom today. Mark Nidham, Informational Technology Standing Committee Chair. You have the committee's report. Are there any additions to this report? There is uh, one addition that I would like to add to the report. Um, it is uh, that uh, Google has uh, determined that we can no longer have a free uh, email domain for wbcci.net and is attempting to charge us. So we have to. Uh, there's a. Uh, there's some some analysis to be done. What the uh, uh, 503c or not 503c organization, as in our, as in our case, can do can do to actually keep our uh, airstreamclub.net and wbcci.net uh, accounts active. Thank you, Mark. Are there any questions from the board? From the region vice presidents. From the audience. Thank you, Mark, for joining us by Zoom. Is there a report? Is there a report from the International Rally Committee? Oh, oh my. I have nothing to report at this time. <laughs> oh, the last time we knew, Lori put out, we had 800 and... I apologize. I was, I was watching. Hang on. Me and Carmichael is having technical difficulties. <laughs> I now muted it, and I apologize. <laughs> Right now for international, we have 824, 29, 29 trailers registered for international. <laughs> so we're getting to our thousand quota that I want to be at. Okay. Um, Rick Sipo, chair of the International Rally Site Standing Committee. You have the committee's report. Are there any additions to the report? Should be on. Okay. Rick hasn't joined us this morning. So, um, are there any questions from the board? Region officers, the audience. Thank you, Rick, for your report. Per Hamquest, Chair of International Relations and Standing Committee. You have the committee's report. Are there any additions to this report? Uh, 
Uh, yes, Mr. President, I'd like to add that the big subject of this committee has been to work with uh, setting up a new board for the European Union, and we are uh, eager to help them get that uh, put in place. Thank you, Perry. Are there any questions from the board? Bill Wild. Mr. President, I'm not clear on why we had to suspend the charter. Can you briefly say what happened that caused that? <laughs> so there were two reasons for suspending the charter. The first one was that there was a uh, trademark violation um, where the European Union had established a website which used a DNS name that was not approved and it was not in compliance with our trademark agreement with Airstream King. And in failing to respond to us to that, we took the next step, which was to um, pull the charter or suspend the charter. It also coincided with the realization that they didn't have a formally elected board in place to operate, which is why we also didn't hear back from them. So now, the trademark violation has been addressed, um, but the board establishing a, a properly elected board is still um, something we are working. I'd just like to add to that that I've been working with them on that, and um, they're definitely getting on board with us and getting things straightened out for us. So hopefully soon we'll be reinstated. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you, Perry. In compliance with bylaws, Article 3, Section 6, Page 2, the international third vice president elected in the odd number year shall serve a two-year term as committee chair. Karen Fisher is the chair of the Lifetime Membership Fund Standing Committee. You have the committee's report. Are there any additions to this report, Karen? No additions. I just want to uh, reiterate that I am looking for at least one additional person who would be willing to serve on this committee with me. Currently have myself and Terry. Warren on the committee. Thank you, Karen. Are there any questions from the board? From the region presidents? From the audience? Thank you, Karen. In compliance with bylaws, Article 3, Section 7, page 4, the international third vice president elected in the even number years who shall serve a two year term as committee. Per Hamquest is the chair of the Long Range Planning and Standing Committee. We have the, you have the report, committee's report. Are there additions to this report? Mr. President, I would like to clarify the essence of that report. And it's a strong suggestion that we essentially move the long range planning process out of a sidecar committee and into the IBT and the executive committee where it really belongs. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Any questions from region vice presidents or from the audience? Matt Hackney? Uh, Matt Hackney, past region three president. I want to uh, simply comment that the purpose of creating the long range planning committee was in essence, because there was no long range planning and I look forward to the time when the executive committee or executive council will really embrace a long range plan. Uh, it has been obvious by the actions of the most recent several executive committees that they do embrace that philosophy. I just wanted to know that I agree there is no longer a purpose served on the side of our committee. Thank you, Matt. I'm glad to be here, and I'm not the only one. <laughs> Thank you, Perry. Terry Warren, Chair of the Membership Standing Committee. You have the committee's report. Are there any additions to this, any additions to this report? Terry. We'll just do this. Okay, let's do uh, the only addition is that as of today, we have 7,339 members, which is an increase of almost 200 since the report was initially filed. Thank you, Terry. Any questions from the board? From the region vice presidents, from the audience, 
Thank you, Terry. Is there a report from the National Rally Standing Committee? Oh, she's coming. There she is. Stuck there. I did. I did not do my report um, in a timely manner and did not get it in. Uh, I did do have, uh, probably due to the, the confusion of things with this COVID of what's running, what's not running, when, and some communication on my part. But since then, I have gotten several reports, and we seem to be starting up again. And I'll have a report and the information into the office if they haven't come for what they need. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Any questions from the board? Any questions from the region vice presidents? Any questions from the audience? Okay. Andrew Selking, Chair of Nomination Standing Committee. You have the committee's report. Are there any additions to this report, Andy? I don't have any additions. I, I would like to just re read the names of the people uh, that have submitted their names. Uh, Eric McHenry for president, Harry Hamquist, first vice president, Karen Fisher, second vice president, Millie O'Donnell, third vice president, Matt Hackney, treasurer, and Terry Warren, secretary. Are there any questions from the board? From the region vice presidents? From the audience. Thank you, Andy. Ms. Smithson, Chair of the Publication Standing Committee. We have the committee's report. Are there any additions to this report at this time? Thank you, Mr. President. I do have two additions. My sounding board has increased by one. I met the lovely Jane Briggs at the Rose Prairie Valley, and she said yes. So I have one more member of my sounding board. Also, I don't know if anybody cares, but in November, I read and responded to 29 newsletters. December, there were 23. So I don't know, I'm a number person. Are, are there any questions from the board? Region vice presidents or the audience? Thank you. Is there a report from the technical standing committee? Okay, we can either take a break now or we can just go another half hour and take our lunch break for an hour and then come back. What's the overall consensus? Can you on for a half hour? Continue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Special committee reports and the WBCCI Foundation reports are next. Karen Fisher, president of the WBCCI Foundation. You have the foundation's report before you. Are there any additions to this report? I turn the button on. Sorry about that. Special committee reports with and WBCCI Foundation reports are next. Karen Fisher, president of the WBCCI Foundation. You have the foundation's report before you. Are there any additions to this report, Karen? I want to make sure that everyone online and in the room is aware that that report was updated uh, just last evening. Um, it was my fault. I sent the wrong file to the um, But I want to point out um, that, and for those in the room, at least for the IBT in the room, I did put a hard copy at your spot. The, um, the changes include um, that we did send out a uh, appeal uh, on early December or in late November. Uh, that appeal resulted in net donations of $425.03. We want to thank those members who donated. The second change to the original report is that the financial report was updated 
through December 31st it is uh, that I gave you where it's included in the packet. One thing that has happened since the end of the year, um, so it doesn't belong in this report, but I want to make people aware is Pete Yank uh, did turn in a resignation. He had to um, step down for personal reasons. So in addition to looking for a representative from regions one and two, I'm also looking for a representative from region seven and eight. <laughs> Are there any questions from the board? Region vice presidents? The audience? Thank you, Karen. Mr. President, did you come from the technical standing committee? Yes, and there was nothing. I see. Okay. Um, Jim Cock, Chair of the Executive Committee, Terms of special Service Special Committee. You have the committee's report before you. Are there any additions to this report, Jim? Are there any questions on the report from the board, region vice presidents, audience? According to the policy 16.6.6, interclub section C, interclub shall provide an annual report. Report to the International Board of Trustees at the scheduled IBT meetings at the International Rally. There are three interclubs which have submitted written reports for this midwinter meeting. Don McKelvey, president of the Classic Airstream Interclub. You have the interclub's report before you. Are there any additions to this report? He doesn't see him online either. Are there any questions from the board on the report? From the region vice presidents, from the audience. Thank you, Don, for the report. <clears throat> Carolyn Berkshire, president of the Streamers Interclub. You have the interclub reports before you. Are there any additions to this report? She's outside. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any questions for this? From the board, the regional officers, the vice presidents? Sorry, or from the audience. Thank you, Carolyn. No, it looks like we have one in the audience okay. on Zoom. Who is it? Jim Johnson is on. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Okay, I I uh, raised my, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, I just raised my hand. I've got an amateur radio report at the end of the rest of them, okay? Okay, thank you. Oh. Mr. Denmark? So he can't do that? No, it's a few. Yeah, we should have at least of that report done. Where would that come out? Okay, Jim, that'll be um, after the back report, we'll have you do your um, ham uh, operator report. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Lisa Sly, president of the Vintage Airstream Interclub. You have the Interclub report before you. Are there any additions to this report? Are there any questions from the board? Question. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, you said current membership was as of January of 2021. Is that a typo or? The bird of that for January of 2020. Okay. Actually, no, I actually know that we are about less than that because it's it fluctuates as we pass in the beginning. Yeah. 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 Remember when you talk, you got to identify yourself. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Any questions from the region vice presidents? The audience? 
Thank you, Lisa, for your report. Okay. Carolyn Berkshire. Okay. Carolyn Berkshire, president of the Indy Streamers Interclub. We have you have the Interclub report before you. Are there any additions to this report? Could you come up to the microphone, please, since this is being broadcasted live? I'm Carolyn Beardshire, and I'm president of the Indy Streamers Inter Club. And the only thing I have to report is good news. We're now at 202 members. All right, great. We have had two gatherings. We're anticipating a rendezvous before Freiburg. And uh, hopefully we can get all to park together at Freiburg. That's really important to us because we are people travelers spread out over the entire country and we need to get together. Okay, so thank you. Are there any questions from the board? From the region vice presidents? From the audience? Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, Jim Johnson. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay, great. Okay, uh, this is for the Amateur Radio Club. I'm sorry that I missed the uh, deadline for the written report. Uh, so uh, we have 317 net members as of uh, just a day or two ago. We were fairly uh, active at Lebanon with uh, four different events, uh, exams. Uh, we had 18 uh, people take exams. 15 of those were uh, WBAC club members and three of them were locals. Uh, we're doing a, a presentation and some prizes at the Orlando Hamcation, which we do every year in February. And uh, we also have a daily HF long range net on almost every day of the year. There's a couple of days that we don't. And finally, just want to remind everybody that the, the purpose of the ARC and the amateur radio in um, general is for emergency communications. So uh, that I'll make the report short and sweet. Uh, so thank you. Any questions? From the board? From the region vice presidents? From the audience? This is just a reminder that when they have deadlines for dates and stuff, they've got to be turned in on time so we can put these in the script and have them distributed to everybody. Okay. There is no unfinished business. There are four items of new business. Motion 1-R-1 is from Eric McHenry and is titled IBT Restructure. I would suggest take the lunch. Okay. Start right now. It's about 30. We're going to take a break right now for an hour's lunch break. We'll be back here at 12.35, and we'll get started on these. Okay, thank you. This is going to get a long time with this guy.
John Lake. He can't hear.
realized. Bring this meeting back to order. During our break, we discovered that Andy Sutton's nominating committee report needs to be updated, so he'll be sending that out to us in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Do we know what the update is? Motion. Yes. Karen Fisher, the National Third Vice President, do we know what the updates are? I mean, what is it additional people running? Is it a no, it's just update? a process on it that needs to be updated. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Let's begin where we dropped off at, which was motion one dash R1 is from Eric McHenry in this title, IBT restructure. Eric, will you please read your motion? I move that the International Board of Trustees submit to the WBCCI membership the following constitutional commitment. Constitutional Article 7, officers and their election, and Article 8, Board of Trustees to be deleted, and a new Article 7, Board of Trustees, and Article 8, International Officers to be inserted. Is there a second? Second. Second by Bill Wild. Please read your proposed impact, background, and financial impact statements. A clarification, I apologize. So I do I do want to present the PowerPoint that was part of the package that after the these guys after the uh, purpose and impact. After we get to the questions. Okay, perfect. Purpose and impact restructure the executive committee with the following objectives. Develop an executive council structure that reduces the total time commitment expectation of its members to a manageable number. Help to attract talented individuals and enhance succession and continuity and open opportunities to serve a broader set of WBCCI members. Allow broad executive council participation without requiring ascension to president. Provide a structure and process that helps the IBT select officers that have the right skills at the right time. Proven leadership track records, active involvement, excitement in WBCCI, et cetera. Get beyond the learning curve and help continuity by increasing terms of office to two years versus one. Make it easier to run the club by adopting a proven board structure used by most nonprofits, local governments, for profits, et cetera. Integrate strategic planning and oversight for standing and special committees into the executive council structure. That was your impact background statement? That was the um, purpose and impact. Okay. Okay, and background? Yes. Background. A special committee was formed as a result of the discussions at the International Board of Trustees meeting in Lebanon, Tennessee. The special committee was chartered to re review our current leadership structure, review best practices in government, nonprofit, and corporate governing boards, then report back to the executive committee with recommendations. This motion implements additional constitutional recommendations put forward by the special committee and presented to the IBT in December 2021. Financial impact. Some impact to be managed to the budget process. Thank you. Let me just remind everybody to have your phones on mute for this because this is going to be a, a probably good discussion area. So make sure they're off ring. Um, are there any questions or just oh, oh your PowerPoint? Yep. I'm sorry. Yeah, I will be uh, talking us through a PowerPoint. Um, our corporate manager is going to bring that up. Uh, as she's bringing that up, I do have a couple of preparatory comments or in advance comments. First, as I mentioned, this motion is consistent with recommendations from the special committee and the transition planning team. And I just have to say thank you, you know, for the WBCI members and officers who did the bulk of the work bringing this together. And it was a substantial body of work that occurred over the months of October to, frankly, a couple of days ago. This motion includes changes based on input from the IBT discussion that we all had on Tuesday. 
And then also a special thanks to Karen and to Tom for working to update the revised motion language instead of us going to happy hour <laughs> that is being presented today. So thanks, Karen, and thanks, Tom. It was a lot of detailed work. Uh, so more, more comments before we go to the PowerPoint. Um, there are no changes proposed in this to the resident rules in the IBT. This critical role remains intact, and in fact, it will be strengthened due to the new role that the recent presidents have, the increased role they have in actively selecting the national president, vice president, et cetera. It actually increases their uh, responsibility and, and impact, frankly. If passed, the motion will be, will be presented to the 100 plus delegates uh, that represent each of our local clubs. Uh, after I go through the PowerPoint, Lori Plummer, our corporate manager, will give a rough overview and timing of the communications plan that will begin within the next 30 days if this is approved to move to delegates. And this communication plan is targeted at providing information, information to our members and delegates um, of the choices that, that are in front of them. Um, there was a proviso, just provisional proviso. Proviso. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, uh, please just be patient. This is a lot of stuff for me to go over. So there's a proviso that you will see at the bottom of the amendment <laughs> in front of you now. The proviso reads that if the delegates pass this amendment, it becomes effective August 1st, 2022. Additional transition and time and details will be addressed by policy changes to be presented at the July 30th, 2022 IBT board meeting. Okay, and again, in the interest of transparency, um, thank you, Bill, and thank you, um, Brad, and others. In addition to structuring the IBT, this constitutional motion includes language that also aligns the international officer term dates with the fiscal year, and that's August 1st to July 31st. Um, just as a side point, right now, they're aligned to when the international rally happened. This motion has some incidental language that says that those terms will now be set to the fiscal year, so determined date of July, August 1st to July 31st. This motion also includes language that removes the international rally dates from the Constitution, but is prepared to leave it in the bylaws. That's kind of a complicated discussion, but the bylaws as they stand today generally provide the, the governing board to select the data from the part. Uh, to a month appropriate uh, to the geographical region. In other words, it doesn't have to be in July. In, and in some ways, I would say most importantly, this allows the full IBT, so all of the region presidents and the rest of the tech council, uh, to select a president who demonstrates the best leadership, teamwork, and collaborative skills to work with the full board. It's my hope that if adopted, this would lead to a board that can debate and act on difficult issues and opportunities in an open and, uh, and uh, respectful way. This presentation is also accompanied by a detailed document that includes roughly 30 frequently asked questions. And after the presentation, the overview, Tom Smithson, our CBL chair, will talk to the specific motion language. Okay, PowerPoint. Jim Cock, a past international president, as the board has heard from many times, uh, was appointed by Time Off, our president, to the new special committee. Uh, he and his team, Jim's team, did a phenomenal job, in my opinion. Um, I was involved, Fitzman was involved, Karen Fisher, and the more recently. Next slide, please. We'll talk about today briefly is the background and goal of the structure proposal and next steps. Now, many in the IBT have already seen this, but it's critical for us. I think you all said that everyone else who's hearing these discussions understand what we're doing in starting from. So many of you haven't heard this online, so we're going to go through it again in an abbreviated manner, uh, perhaps not as good as uh, Mr. Cox did, but we'll go through it. Next slide, please. The background and the rationale for considering a change the structure is that you know, our club is facing a significant opportunities in the membership growth, finances, partnerships, and technology. A structure change at the leadership level would enhance the club's ability to quickly recognize and respond to these trends. 
In addition, clearly defined areas of responsibility, a larger leadership team with diverse skill sets and strategic goals involving leadership in all, in all regions should strengthen and elevate the club's position amongst potential members and life organizations. So we're saying that nothing is broken now, but there's opportunities for significant improvement. Next slide, please. So since our foundation as a club in the early 50s, our club has been led by a president, followed in subsequent years by the first vice president, and then the second vice president, and the third vice president, all serving one-year terms. The structure has generally worked over the years, but it has not been perfect. Every year, the one-term limits you know, cause us to lose the experience of our international officers, really just as they're reaching their full stride in office. In addition, the growing complexity of our club suggests we would benefit from a more diverse IDT, bringing in additional qualified individuals with strong leadership, um, finance, potentially legal, communications, governance backgrounds, who really want to serve our club, but who may not have a goal for ascension to president. In other words, people who may want to serve on the board for a two-year term and then step off. Next slide, please. So the goals we touched on earlier to basically improve the EC structure, select officers that have the right skills at the right time. I, I just have to stress, this board is a critical board for helping our club be what our members want it to be, whether it be their interest in caravans, uh, their interest in outdoors, activities, whatever it is. This board helps those local clubs and structures um, function well. We need to have of off executive officers who demonstrate that they can work with this board in a collaborative way to make decisions and move forward after a good debate. And frankly, also make it easier to run the club. And we look at the transition team said, we really suggest to you all that you adopt a proven board structure that is used by most nonprofits, local governments, for profit, et cetera. Just a bit of a, a personal aside, I think most of you know that uh, in addition to me being a geek, technology geek, I've had the, um, the pleasure of serving on a number of nonprofit and now for profit boards. And those range from boards as large as the Food Bank of my local county. Um, and United Way board president to serving as a board president of our local observatory and working on a group of board that provided services for young kids uh, that had lost their parents. And I can say that all of those boards had a similar, very structure, similar to what we're proposing today, where the members elect people onto the board and then the board decides within the board who is best qualified to lead the organization at that time. Next slide, please. So the new structure, again, it's really hard to read. I won't go through it all, but basically there, the, term, the, the, the term International Board of Trustees is an umbrella organization. That's all of us at this table here, most of us. And it includes, it includes elected, elected people, like your elected officers. It also includes region presidents who are elected, but elected by the regions because they best understand and can represent the region's interests and desires. And that's kind of the strength of the IBT, coupling local expertise and knowledge, you might call it state's knowledge, if you will, with people that are focused more on the club level together and have done well and works well together. So you can all read this, it's part of the motions as well, but this is the structure uh, we're looking at uh, proposing that the transition team is looking to propose. Next slide, please. This is a little bit dated, but we didn't want to confuse with too much information. This was actually presented about a month ago by Tim and his uh, transition, Jim Cock and his transition team. And this first bullet has largely been accomplished over the last few days. So a subset of the IBT, and again, I want to thank um, some of the region presidents here for serving on that, um, have sat with Jim and some other people to sort of fine tune the proposal that we came into Savannah with. They finalized the number of BC members, they finalized the titles, 
and the rough responsibility, they started to develop a transitional scenario to a couple of scenarios. They've done that body of work. It's reflected in general in both the motion and the proposal to be adopted in 2022 with bylaws changing just before that. The critical timing on it that they spoke to was that, you know, we reserve constitutional amendments to generally once a year because it is incumbent upon us to poll the, the members for their purposes. And so the constitutional amendments typically will go out uh, in the spring and then all the members are 16,000 members will have the opportunity to voice their support or rejection of any proposals the board comes up with, and then that gets determined in the next national rally. Next slide, please. Okay, that's that's it for this. I'm going to um, turn it. Is that it? I'm going to now shift to ask next presenter as part of this. And when we talked about this with the board of trustees over the last couple of days, a lot of questions came up about look. This is a lot of new information. Uh, what is the timing for getting this to our members so they can be informed and they can provide their feedback? And so we realized at that time that a lot of our members don't really understand how things go from here to delegates to members to blah, blah, blah. So Lori Plummer, our program manager, is going to describe that process. Uh, thanks, Eric. So, um, so everybody is aware of delegates meeting for 2022 will be on Wednesday, July 7th and in Freiburg, Maine. Seven? Seven. 27th. Um, July 27th, 2022. The process um, currently in our, in our bylaws is constitutional amendments are due to HQ by March 1st each year. At that time, once I receive the constitutional amendments, I send them to the CBNL uh, committee and they do a report which is due back to HQ by March 20th. The delegate packets, and when I say delegate packets, this is a packet that we send out to all the club presidents so they can um, educate and pull their members. Those packets are due to the local clubs 80 days prior to the delegates meeting, which is May 8th of 2022. And we send those packets both electronically and by mail in hopes uh, to make sure the local club receives them. Providing this gets passed, gets approved to go to our membership. We have approximately six months to come up with a good communication plan to educate our members so they understand what we are trying to accomplish. Our communication avenues will include the Blue Beret, our website, emails, videos. We will establish some talking points for our officers, as well as we can set up Zoom Q&A sessions for our members. Um, if, if they want to speak to somebody on the, on the board transition team, somebody who's been involved with that as well. We also, um, in the month of April, is traditionally the, the month of the candidate information. And then in the month of May in the Blue Beret is when the physical a collapse version of the constitution is published to our members. So with that is, that is the current uh, plan. Uh, thank you, Lori. And for the for the final final part of this, um, I've asked our uh, CBL chair Tom Smithson to talk us through the proposed amendment, not the red lines. You've got that as part of you, but the proposed proposed specific language. As as someone said to us at Can Over, uh, you know, give it in a small way. So we want to make sure that we understand the specific language of the amendment that we'll be proposing to you to send to the delegates. Thank you, Eric. This thing is on. Um, what I'm, I'm not going to read what's going to be deleted. I'm going to read what is being proposed. The new Article 7 of the trustees would read the following. The administrative body of the International Club should be the Board of Trustees, sometimes after referred to as the Board, the IBT. The International Board of Trustees 
computer wants me to do something. The International Board of Trustees is composed of two membership components. First, the Executive Council, 10 members elected at large by the membership. Second, the 12 region presidents of WBCCI. B, the IBT shall have a president, vice president, recording secretary and treasurer elected by the IBT from the executive council members and the past and the past board president. In addition to non-voting trustees, the chief executive officer of Airstream Inc. or an executive officer of Airstream Inc. designated by said chief executive officer and the corporate manager of WBCCI. C, in the event of a regional president, region president is unable to be present at a meeting of the IBT, the next ranking region vice president in order of first and second shall sit with the board at that meeting as a voting member representing that region in all matters coming before the board. D, each member of the board shall serve a, su a success until a successor is appointed or elected or the member's resignation is accepted by the board. Section two, the board shall hold periodic meetings based on WBCCI's fiscal year at a time and place designated by the president. Special meetings may be called by the president, vice president, or by 10 voting members of the board of trustees. Section three, the board of trustees shall have full authority to construe and interpret the club's constitution and bylaws and policies and may delegate this authority to its constitution bylaws committee. Section four, a quorum of the board of trustees shall consist of 12 members. Section five, a member of the board of trustees shall hold no international region or local club office or position other than that office or position which places him on said board. Nothing herein contained shall disqualify an international officer or region officer from service upon standing or special committees. Article eight, executive officers. The executive office section one, the executive officers of the international club shall be a president, a vice president, a recording secretary, and a treasurer. Section two, all executive officers shall be elected from the executive council of the international board of trustees for a term of two years. The officers so elected shall take office at the start of the WBCCI fiscal year. No officer shall serve more than two consecutive terms in any one office. Section three, in the event of the death or resignation, an executive, an executive officer of an, of an executive officer or their inability to fulfill the duties of that office, the International Board of Trustees shall elect a replacement from the executive council members. There is a proviso. If this delegate, if the delegates pass this amendment, it becomes effective August 1st, 2022. Additional transition and timing details will be addressed. The bylaws and policy changes to be presented at the July 30th, 2022 IBT meeting. Thank you, Tom. So before I, I conclude my, my comments, um, I just have to I'll offer my, my personal comments. I think it's important. Uh, I thought it was important to be somewhat neutral on this in the past discussion. This is a recommendation that I fully supported, but was owned and presented by the same committee later, considered by you all. You know, now though, Eric personally, I, it's my strong hope that this board agrees to present this to the delegates for vote. I do believe our club is getting extremely complicated. There's a number of issues and opportunities that we have now that we didn't have 50 years ago. And while this group works well, I think it would benefit from allowing people, additional people to come onto the board that don't want to be president. As I mentioned before, I'm an officer of a multi-billion dollar bank where we live in Sonoma County. There's no way I'll ever be bank president. Don't want to be. But I have the opportunity to serve on that board for a term or two and contribute, in this case, the technology expertise and cybersecurity and stuff. I think we should leave room for that on our boards as well. There's people out there that can help us that may not 
have had the time or opportunity to rise to the region president level or rise up through the ranks like and the time commitments we've all put into it i think it doesn't hurt us i think that our members entrust this board to make decisions that benefit them i i, I they care about the club they may not care as much about the structure of the government's governance board as long as we can be effective in what we do. I'm very supportive of it. As I said before, this is a proven, a proven scenario that has worked through almost all of the complications that we grapple with. Um, this structure has worked through absences on boards, it's worked through vacancies and resignations, it's worked through poor performing board members, it's worked through Who's going to be president next year? Just like your local clubs and region towns as well. So I'm very supportive. Um, I hope it's some sort of delegates. I, I want to thank all of you though for having this discussion. A number of people have said to me this is by far one of the best discussions that this body has had in terms of openness and time it took. We spent like six months looking at this already, and actually more like nine months if you count Tennessee. I really love this process. I'm proud of being part of it. So so Ty, thank you for taking that off and. Those conclude my, my comments. Are there any questions or discussions concerning this motion from the board? Larry mm -hmm. Madden. Larry Madden and six president. I looked over the motion from a positive standpoint, from a negative standpoint, and from a neutral standpoint. The one, someone like I have, and I, I realize this is a potential, but if I read it, and please feel free to correct me. I'm quite used to that at home. <laughs> <laughs> I see a potential that a president could do a term of two years, another term of two years, go to the immediate past president for two years or the possibility of another two years. So it could be in the position for eight years. Is that correct or is that incorrect? You're going to be a president, you could be president for four years, but a past president for four years is the possible. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. That's a correct statement. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else on the board? Yes. No, some, Andy's got one. <laughs> Andy Selkin, past international president. Uh, this is a, a question to the maker of the motions. Am I correct in my assumption that if we do this, the new executive committee is now going to be president, first vice president, secretary, and treasurer? Uh, you are correct that those will be the roles, the titles elected uh, by the IB, by the board. But is that the executive? I'm sorry, Andy, I don't think I understood that. Can you ask the question again? I apologize. Your executive group is going to be made up of the president, first vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Currently, it's made up of same thing, but you've got a second VP, you've got a third VP, and you have a past international president serving on that. Uh, Lori, can you bring up the slide you know, pack that shows that, that is that is that the way it is? So the past international president will not be part of that executive group anymore. Yeah. That's not. I don't really see that. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get a pull back up. No, it's no, okay. past international president. By the way, it looks like he's part of the board, but not part of the executive group. That's the Yes. Where does it stay here? I understand the question now. Yeah, it's like a group, yes. I don't know if everybody will be able to. Yeah, so Andy, under, I believe it's, I only part of it, section B, it says, when uh, the around the president, vice president, or party secretary, um, the past board president. So the, the past board president is part of the executive council. Yes. Oh. something for that. Okay. Karen is next, and I have somebody on Zoom call. I'm going to answer the question. I had found it. So we're going to go to John Holly on the Zoom call. Oh. 
Hello. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. John. Thank you. Uh, I, I think this is a good move. I do have some questions and concerns. Uh, I personally have served on no less than eight boards in various capacities, a board member, board president, and an executive, uh, anywhere from 10 members up to 85 members and uh, in my career. And um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them was addressed by Andy a minute ago, but how it will affect the current structure of the vice presidents and how they will be included in this structure, number one. Number two, uh, question I have is uh, to finalize the titles and responsibilities. It appears that that might be something that's very important before this is voted on. And I hope that that would be uh, thought through before it's presented to the delegates at in Freiburg. In other words, right now, it is true. Doesn't the president really have the responsibility just for planning the annual national rally that we have and getting to that point? Uh, so will that still be the responsibility or is there other things that come into play? What will be the role of the president particularly? Um, I, I understand the role of the other three officers. And my third question is, um, how will the four members at large be elected? Must they uh, re uh, respond to requests to get elected by the membership? Because isn't it the four officers plus the corporate manager and the past president would be plus four at large, or is it three at large? Because we include the Airstream rep also as a non-voting member. Anyway, I, uh, I do favor this move. I just feel that there's a lot of questions we have uh, that need to be cleared up before Freiburg, and I hope we can come to that point. I think it's a good direction we're, we're moving in, and I understand the need for it. There's just a few questions like I presented that uh, need to be cleared up to the membership. So the membership is also on board, and we don't have a lot of uh, divisiveness or, or dissension. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, John. Let me try to address those. Um, the slide pack that I presented uh, was generated before the transition team looked at it. So the titles have been firmed up. Uh, they are in the motion. So they are in the motion accurately. And those titles are uh, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Those are the elected titles. Does that answer that question? Recording. Recording secretary. That's recording, yeah. Uh, John, is that answer that first question? Oh, uh, what about the uh, members at large? How are they elected? How do they get on the executive committee? Yes, yeah, so there's a couple more to the question. So what the amendment in front of you says is that they will be elected by the members. And the process by which our club elects officials is through a direct membership vote that happens once a year. So in as much as we currently elect third vice president second vice president, first vice president, president, through a membership vote. That is how anyone on the executive council will be elected onto that. And the second part of their question, I think is a critical one. And that said, how will they be sourced? How will they be selected? So we have a nominations committee. I think any of you that have served on the board understand that the nominations committee in that process is probably one of the most critical ones and getting the right people onto the board and getting people to express interest in the board and being able to assess the applications that come into the board. So as the um, this says, there still will be a nomination committee. Nothing changes that. The difference is that if this moves forward, the nomination committee will have the responsibility of not just nominating a third VP and a second and a first and a president and a treasurer and a secretary, You'll also have the responsibility of nominating the board members or directors at large. So there's this role expands by a few more people. I would say though that it's even more critical though to get the breadth of people we're looking for, this is an error comment, to have a very robust process for the nominations committee, um, whereby we openly solicit interest in serving on this board. We make it available to anyone in the club. They were really clear what the requirements of the position is. It's not that you've served on a board before or you've managed X million dollars. It's that, hey, what are the job titles? What are the responsibilities for a board member? We have to be clear what those are. And hopefully, we'll get a whole bunch of people requesting to be placed on the ballot 
for the open positions. The transition team has already shared with us that in their discussions, they found there's actually a lot of people who would be interested that just don't want to do two year terms. I mean, don't want to do, you know, have to be president. So we expect that if we do our job right, our club to the nominations committee will have a lot of people interested in applying for board positions at large to be on the executive committee. The role of the president doesn't change in any material way. There's nothing in this that talks about a change to the roles of the president. In fact, in one of the frequently asked questions, and there's roughly 30 of them in the document that was published, there's about 30 questions in there that came from various people in the last six months. The role of the president doesn't change. Um, I'll go into detail, but it doesn't change for what it is today. Uh, I've heard questions about the international rally. That specifically isn't one of the, by bylaws, heavy responsibilities of the international president, though historically it has been one of the heavy roles of contribution. Uh, as you've seen from Freiburg, and you'll see in 2023, Lori Plummer's group is starting to help to the rally committee to plan those more and more, to provide extra resources in terms of planning of that. That work will continue as a rally committee definition. It's not a national president. John, does that answer your three questions? Uh, pretty well. I, I think it, it needs probably a little bit more uh, specification regarding the individual duties, uh, particularly of the president. For instance, um, I know the president, who is our chief executive officer of the corporation of what we what we are as a club, um, it's important. So that means the president still has final say, veto power, et cetera, et cetera, over everything that's going on, I suppose. Uh, but that that better explains it. I think in the process over the next six months or so, those things can be better defined, should be better defined. And um, that will clear up a lot of things and any kind of uh, questions that our members may have uh, to vote this through. Thanks. And thanks, John. Tom Smith, the CBL chair, is going to talk about the current, what's currently the role of the president um, and other things and how that really doesn't change. I think that's what he's going to say. Right on up. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Tom Smith, and CBL chair. Um, Don, uh, John has raised a very good question. And as I have told this board, and I will continue to repeat, my mantra is I don't want to see anything in the con Constitution that says, uh, what we are going to do or how we're going to do it. Currently, the Constitution does list the duties of the president. However, if this motion is passed and the delegates decide that we're going to have this new structure, then there will be a significant change in the bylaws, which will take those duties of the president, the duties of the executive council, the duties, duties of the IBT in general, and put it into the bylaws where it actually should be. I hope that answers your question, John. And unfortunately, we can't do this at this moment because it would be in conflict with the existing constitution. Well, so okay, any other members on the board have a question? Yeah. Any other members on the board have a question? Any other region vice presidents? Anybody in the audience? Hackney? Matt Hackney is in, in one of the hats I wear is to backstop. Uh, Tom Smithson is one of the members of his Constitutional Bylaws Committee. I'd like to offer a couple of friendly amendments. One to correct an existing uh, error in our Constitution and the other to perhaps clarify or, or better define a question that uh, the international past president has about the motion of the amendment. Uh, the first would be in article seven, section one, we currently and in the new motion incorrectly identify the IBT as an administrative body. It is actually the governing body of the club. And so, the word administrative would be removed and replaced with the word governing. And section one would read the governing body of the international club shall be the board of trustees, sometimes hereafter referred to as the board or as the IBT. The second and related change would be to change article eight 
which in the proposal is exec, excuse me, executive officers, that would be retitled executive council. And that new section one would then read the executive council is the administrative body of the international club and shall oversee the daily operations of the club between meetings of the IBT. And then I renumbered the remaining sections to address that. If if you would be in your notice. Um, so, Duane, you're going to help us through this new process. So, yeah. as, a, as a maker, I'm fully supportive of accepting that as a friendly amendment. Okay. Okay. So, what you need is you need to see the exact wording that uh, Matt has provided you with and make that change on your motion. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Joanne. Would you, if I have it in front of me, would you like me to, to read it? Or, um, uh, could you read the can I hand it to someone else? The new section. <laughs> okay. Make the two changes as you read it, please. Okay. So, first for Article 7, the word administrative is removed and placed with the word governing. Section 1 would then read the governing body of the International Club shall be the the Board of Trustees, sometimes hereafter referred to as the Board of IBT. The next one is in Article 8, Executive Officers. The name of this article so be changed from Executive Officer to Executive Council. So add a new section one, which would read, quote, the Executive Council is the administrative body of the International Club and shall oversee the daily operations of the club between meetings of the IBT, period. And then Linda needs, Linda needs a copy of that, so she needs that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah there's one of them out there. Okay. Someone from the back. Anybody else with questions from the audience? I'm, up. I'm gonna have Bill Wild go ahead. Oh wait, John, John Becker is standing oh, oh, there. Wait, this process is this a question on the friendly amendment or a question on the second one? Do we have to move on the friendly amendment first? No, when when the friendly amendment is offered now, the motion is still yours and you may make any changes that you agree to. Thank you. And there's no one. need to vote. Okay, so I've agreed to that. That's good. You've agreed to that and we're good to go. Right. Thanks, Matt. Hi, uh, I, I hope that as the frequently answered questions are developed, et cetera, that there could be an explanation of, and here were the alternatives that this group considered and why they're inferior going forward, because that'll help communicate it to the members. The structural question I have is, right now, my understanding is we vote directly for someone to do the treasurer's position. We can review that person's qualifications, I view it as a position that requires a certain amount of technical expertise to keep us out of trouble. Right now, we have to hope that if for the 10 positions, we have a slate of 15 candidates that somewhere in the 15, somebody has that technical expertise so they can make it on to the executive council. So the IBT can then confirm, yes, you can have the treasurer's position. It's just an issue I see because we won't directly elect the treasurer will elect a slate of candidates from those offered up to the membership and the membership has to be able to choose somebody who has that technical expertise for especially that position. Oh, and I'm John Becker, a member of the Four Corners unit. <laughs> so, so John, I'll, I'll speak for the um, so the, the special committee's thoughts on that is that, yes, that's exactly, you're actually right, you're exactly right. This happens on pretty much any board out there where they have to elect a treasurer. And hopefully, if the nominations committee has been successful in their job of looking for applicants with critical skill sets, one of them would be treasurer, one of them would probably be board secretary, then there is a candidate. Uh, what is often seen in the bylaws, and what I believe will be discussed at this moving forward, is what do we do as a club? If we're unable to fill a vacant position with a qualified person, and like in most regions or local clubs, that then becomes the option for the governing body, in this case the IBT, to do a special election or direct appointment. 
That's typical for bylaws. Again, most of the regions have that already, and most of the local clubs have it already for the positions that we can't fill with the required skill sets. Thank you. Bill Wild. Mr. President, I take exception to the second notion, uh, second item that was mentioned uh, of changing executive officer to be executive council as the, uh, the, the committee and the team have been going through this process, the term executive officer applied to those four officers. The term executive council applied to everyone who was in that pool of candidates which might be elected as executive officers. Uh, we, uh, by changing this, we would be creating confusion about which group of individuals we're referring to. I understand. I, I, I don't have a personal, or I would look to the body to decide what's the best approach. Karen Fisher. Karen Fisher, Interim Center, Vice President. Um, I worked on this and talked with Matt about it. Uh, the reason I suggested changing it to executive council instead of executive officers is by adding that new section one that says the executive council is the administrative body and handles the day-to-day -day stuff. Then the title needed to be executive council to support that. If the title is executive officers, then section one shouldn't talk about um, the executive council. And I think you want the executive council to be your administrative body, not just your executive officers. Does that make sense? Anything else, Bill? Bill Wild, Region 3. It's, I'm ambivalent about what we call the groups, but if we're gonna call the four officers the executive council, then there needs to be a clearly defined descriptor for the body of individuals from which those officers can be elected. Karen? Um, unfortunately, it's not in this section. It's actually in the previous section. It talks about who the executive council is. It's the president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, the executive council members, and the immediate past president. And that's actually defined in the IBT section under part A, where it's comprised of two membership components. First, the executive council, 10 members elected at large. And then the second is the 12 region presidents. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom Smithson. Uh, Tom Smithson, CBO chair. Once again, the bylaws will define the roles and uh, responsibilities of the individual council members. Now, I, 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 once again, I don't want to put that into the constitution. I prefer to have it in the bylaws. And you need to understand that the reason for putting things into the bylaws is because this board can change the bylaws and it can do it with the drop of a dime. On the other hand, if you put it in the constitution, it takes a year and a half to two years to make a change. And sometimes you, you don't want to wait that long. So let's just, it will be in the bylaws, true. Um, Mr. maker, I would say that, um, if, if you're okay going with the CBO's interpretation, I'd like to leave it that way. If we want to talk about it more, let's, let's discuss it some more and get more input from the rest of the board. So, to you, where, where, where's your preference? Uh, I'm not. Who well, I'll read in three. I'm not clear on. Are you asking? Uh, uh, we can talk about this later if that's what you were suggesting. No. Um, are you asking for my. Um, so let me be clear. I apologize. So this whole new process is strange. So we had a friendly amendment. I accepted that, but now it's "quote unquote" my my motion language. I, I unfortunately didn't understand that you, you had some concerns on that topic before I agreed to accept it entirely. So I want to know: Are you okay with it being the way it's been amended to, or would you rather discuss it some more as a group and maybe remit it to something else? Okay, uh, we can take a break if we need to. Also, I would imagine. I'll repeat. I'm not stuck on the use of term, any particular semantic. If we want to call the four executive officers the executive council, I'm, that's fine. 
but there needs to be a different terminology to define the pool of candidates from which those officers are elected. We have to be able to talk about that group that will be elected by the membership. We've been referring to that throughout this entire process as the executive council, as the new name for the executive committee, so to speak, right? If we repurpose that to mean only these four officers, it's confusing to me. Go ahead, John. Let me see. The way I interpret, and I could be wrong, the executive council is made up of four executive officers plus the rest of the people who have been elected to the executive council. So we're kind of confusing terms here. So the current, well, the new executive council would be taking the place of the current executive committee. That is correct. Okay. If you want to call this the executive council, then section one would need to say, Executive officers of the International Club shall be a president, a vice president, a recording secretary, a treasurer, and help me with the number six, I think. We've been using the term directors, other individuals who are in that council. May I ask a question? Are you considering the others on the executive council as executive officers? Or are you just referring to the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer as That's executive right. officers? The latter is correct. Just those four individuals are the executive officers, but all 10 are members of the executive council. By the terminology we've been using so far, which is subject to change, but that's what my point is. I see. If, if this section is titled the executive council, it is, it's also okay. the friendly amendment that was accepted is still okay because the executive council is the executive officers plus the four or five or whatever. Six. Six. Plus the six, that's correct. Okay. And then what is done in step number two is they have specified who the executive officers are, which are specifically those four positions. That is also correct. So, so section one would include an amendment or an addition to the end of that, that says in addition to and a treasurer comma and six, and now might be the right time to name them directors. Not necessary. Or um, six other council members who not, do not hold executive positions, but however you want to say that. In the previous article, Article 7, you, you say Section 1, Article BA, the International Board of Trustees is composed of two membership components. One is the executive council, semicolon. 10 members elected at large by the membership. Second, the 12 regional presidents of WBCCI. Now, in Article 8, Executive Council, Section 1 is simply saying the Executive Council is the administrative body of the International Club. Section 2, the Executive Officers of the International Club shall be a president, a vice president, a recording secretary, and a treasurer. No need. So you're, you're saying you had a new section. Yeah, I apologize, Bill. No, I should have said that. I okay. didn't say it. Um, it's, okay. it's, it's Matt said it right. I stated it incorrectly. I would be fine with that. We're, 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 we're down to uh, wordsmithing at this point, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying that we cannot. Without changing the definition of the word, we can't use the word council without considering the six. Correct, correct. Right. But I, there was a misunderstanding as to what was accepted as a friendly amendment. So yes, we're good. We're good. I'm good. There it is. <laughs> Thank you. Larry Madden. Larry Madden, Region 6 President. How many friendly amendments can we have? <laughs> okay. As many as we need. Yep. I'm asking Eric, first vice president, would you be considerate 
of taking the two consecutive terms of any office down to one, one term of two years to, to the office. And in other words, each officer has one two-year term. I, I'm just very uncomfortable with somebody potentially being in that position for eight years. I'm not opposed there. I'm just processing my wife doesn't look at my picture. <laughs> <laughs> so can you restate your original concern? You and say it's lower than what you said a while ago. And my original concern was that just a potential. A president could be elected doing a real fine job. And he or she is elected for a second term. So that's four years in the office of president. Then they move to the immediate past president for two years. Unless the next president coming up is reelected for two terms. And then you'd be the immediate past president for four years. So that's my concern. Somebody could be in that position for up to eight years and the immediate past president having the vote, whereas president only has a vote in case of a time. Okay, I, I understand that. Uh, let me move to some people who are deeply involved in the transition. Do you either you have a sense of what that discussed and what the special committee in transition looked at? Any insight you can provide? That's that. <clears throat> Brad Briggs, uh, Region 4 President. Uh, it was, thank you. <laughs> it was uh, discussed, and there was discussion about the fact that maybe the, to, to solve the concern that Larry has brought up, maybe the international past president is still part of the executive council but does not have a vote. This was, or just from a, this wasn't part of the transition committee. This was part of them evaluating this to do it. The trans, transition committee is not discussing that part of it. They're going through with what the other special committee did. So we need to follow that to make sure it's not the transition committee. It's our first special committee with Jim Cock in charge of it then that did this. Okay. They came up with a four year term. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, Mr. President, that is correct. The the transition team of which Brad and I were members along with Doug and several other in individuals, Johnny and, and I'm sorry, I can't remember, Barbara, um, were passed the proposal as it was finalized to go to transition. It doesn't really matter what we thought of that. Our task was to figure out how to implement it. In point of fact, we do support it but it would be up to this IBT to decide if we want to entertain Larry's suggestion. Go ahead, Lori. Go ahead, you have a comment then we have online. Um, Lori Comer, corporate manager. I understand what Larry is pointing out, but I also believe in the process as in believe in the restructure of the IBT that if somebody is sitting in a position and they're not fulfilling their duties, that, that we have the mechanisms to remove them. And so I honestly don't believe that that position would become stagnant or, and then I, on, on that purpose. Sorry. Right. Okay. Um, Jennifer <coughs> Schnettler is on. Jennifer Schnettler. Schnettler. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, uh, this is Jenny Schnettler. Um, I was on the original team and I would like to make a comment about why did that evolve to uh, extended terms with the potential for the international past president to remain on as a, in a, to create a, an eight year term. How it all evolved and I have to share with you guys, this took us a long time, this very issue because it does have the potential of yikes, what if you got somebody really bad in there? But therein lies the suppleness and the beauty and flexibility of the way we've structured this in that you can act on it. You're not locked into it. And so let's say we had a really great person serving as president and, and everybody said, you know, this person's got some great, 
great perspective, some great points of view, and we really want to share uh, another two years with this person as president. Let's let's continue them on. Right now, there's zero avenue for an existing president to ever become president again, and that may really lock out some extraordinary talent. So in the effect of um, extending the terms to two years and saying, well, we could allow somebody, but the whole point is that they would have to be a selected, voted and approved by the membership. So it's not this automatic extension of um, an office into an un untenable amount of time. It is all hinge it contingent upon completely the performance that they do. And if it's an extraordinary performance, why would you want them gone? Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I'm a, a Ken Johansson, Region 11 president. I'm a little bit confused here. Um, the other day, the, the six members are elected to the EC, correct? By the membership. Yes. Okay. My understanding of the day was the six were supposed to be region presidents. Am I, did I misunderstand that? American talk, so you know, yeah. I'm sorry, can, before I ask that, can you just restate it to make sure I understood the question accurately? The other day, I my understanding was that six region presidents would be on the executive committee. Where did I get that from? I don't, I don't know. Um, to my knowledge, the proposal has always been that the IBT would be comprised of the 12 people from the regions, the 12 region presidents. I got that. I got, I got that. Will be not those 12. So in addition to people, not those 12. So the six are going to be elected by members. Well, actually, it's ten, but yes, yes, everyone on the executive council would be up for election and selected by the membership body. And then once on that executive council, the IBT board would select the executive officers, which would be. The okay, so vice president, treasurer, and recorded secretary. Okay, I'm going to have a really dumb question here. You have to excuse this, but what's the difference between electing members of the EC and electing the president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, all those positions? What What is really the difference? Okay, I think I'm going to answer this, but I, if I answer not what you're asking, let me know. Um, so, one of the tenets of this is that the membership body gets to pick the people that go on to the executive council, that group of whatever it is. I, I understand that. And that's it for the membership. Then once they're on that, if they do a good job, express interest, have the skill sets, then this board selects from that group, the people who will be the executive officers, the president, the vice president, the secretary, the treasurer. So the difference is only that the membership elects onto the board and the board picks from, from that who are the executive officers. Did that answer the question, Ken? Yes, it did. Thank you. Yep, John Lee's first. And then you have the red jacket. Thank you. John Leak, uh, Palmetto State Airstream Club, former Region 3 president. I don't quite get on this. So I don't have a real good question, except maybe are we trying to fix something that's not broken? Are we trying to find qualified people? I didn't even know we had any unqualified people. So I just don't quite get what all this is about. Um, let, let's, let's don't fix something that's not broken. It, I mean, I'm not, a, I don't, I'm not been in a club a long, long time, but I thought it was clicking along pretty good. And anyway, I appreciate the time. That's that's all I had was a comment. Thank you. Thanks. Who's still on the board? We started the You're next.
Jeff Dalrymple of the Arkansas Razorback Club, uh, along with Larry, I would like uh, uh, the question that I have is that once you have been elected to the executive committee, the 10 members that are elected, and then you're chosen from those within that committee to be one of the international officers, does that change your term on the executive committee? You were elected in the first term to be a member of the committee, and then you are chosen to be president after a year, it, it, it spells out. So are you only president for another year and then you have to be reelected and rechosen? Or does that change? Because if, if, if you're not, you're automatically granting someone another term to which they were never elected. They were elected for a two year term. Thanks, Jeff. I will answer this in two ways. One is when I understand the intent of the special committee was. The second, I'll answer where I see the need, the great need for clarification. So the intent of the special committee was simple in that we want to give two-year terms. So think about how this started. We want to give two-year terms. That's actually pretty straightforward because two-year terms are two-year terms, then you go on election by the members again. Simple, two -year term, much like our original president but with the ability to extend to. Where it got complicated for the special committee was the interest in a requirement for one year prior service on the executive council to be eligible for a uh, to, uh, executive officer position. And that, Jeff, sets up your question, where we're saying if Joe, and Mary gets elected to the executive council by the members, and she really wants to run for president, she has to wait a year, and then she can run, and then this is a two-year, and the way it's written right now, it says that um, the clock resets. So it would say that you've got your one year under the exec council, and then if elected by the, the board, you would get your two-year elected officer position. And then after that, you're back to the two-year terms. That's what it says now. But that is the complication. I personally don't have a position on this. I would look toward how I the founders, you know, and what this board would want to do. I personally don't have a position, but I do strongly believe it needs to be clarified. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, not to put too much civics class in, it would be representational. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you haven't, you were elected to a two year term and it, it only lends itself to, to cloud the issue as Larry has stated that you could serve unlimitedly on the board by moving around within the officer in that international officer structure at the, at the, so, so there's a simple the board, the executive committee. A simple fix to this, the motion maker, when we get ready for a break, I can make it ready either way. First, either remove the one year pre-qualification, which would fix that fundamental problem, right? why it's unique from other boards, the one year, because most boards don't have a, a one year requirement to be eligible for consideration. But that's, I can take that out, or if the board wishes, I can leave it in and basically be clear that that resets the clock. And so really it's three years for your first time going in. The other attribute of that is that the, um, I'm not pointing to you guys, uh, there was an interest in, some of the region officers of saying that your service on here is, is the one year. I'm just going to point to reach officer over here. <laughs> one of the reach officers says, you know, I've been on the IBT for a year. Now, now I want to run for president. I fulfilled my one year experience on the IBT and I can go for two years slot. So there's all these little exceptions in there. And that's what's kind of complicating it. We need to clarify it one way or the other. Yeah, just to, something that sets it out. And I also support the changes that Matt made because there was some ambiguity in the what role the region presidents might play in the future when the executive committee was fully formed. Would they still be able to govern the club? And I like the language that Matt proposed that they are the governing body and the new EC is, is only administrative. I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Chris, you're next. For Sub by Region 5. Okay. Let me get, go back to Matt. Did you accept Matt's? Yes. Okay, so we're changing the names on Article 8. Okay. I need to be very specific because it's kind of confusing. So 
right. article Article eight is now titled in my motion right now as it stands okay. is entitled Executive Council. Okay. There is an no longer titled executive officer, it's called executive council. There is an additional section one, right? Which section one remains. Additional section one just states that um, the executive council is an administrative body of a national Social club and so oversee daily operations of the club. Blah, blah, blah. So it's inserted. That's what okay. the motion stands okay. as it is. And then, like you stated with him, if you come in, if the directors, quote unquote directors, come in, okay, and then you elect one of those to be the president, the vice president, that was my other question. Is that going to reset the time? Because basically you're coming in with the two year, two years, and I, you know, that's not giving the membership the chance, you know, to reelect you after that. And does the IBT elect it every two years, every one year? Or does that have to be in the policy? Okay, that's my question. Boss Yeah. Okay. Okay, Karen Fisher. Karen Fisher, International Third Vice President. I understand all of your questions and all of your concerns. And a lot of those same questions and concerns came up in my mind when we when I first heard this. The problem is we're getting into the how we do things yes, and, that's the that's why and that's the and so we'll have an opportunity to look at all of the how we do things when we get to the bylaws and policy mm -hmm. changes should this get approved by the delegates that is all going to be at the IBT meeting on July 30th so they're all great things and we need to take notes and we need to understand them and I encourage you all to read those revised bylaws and policies when they come out and make sure that all your concerns are addressed. But we really don't want to fine tune that in the Constitution, per Tom Smithson's mantra. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> so I, I fully agree with Karen. I got lost in it. I fully agree with Karen. I got lost in it. The Constitution does not address any of this. It just says there's going to be a president, vice president, and two year term. It doesn't address the one year because that's a bylaw thing. And that would be something that, as President Amat said, would be considered over the next three or four months by the team who indicated he was going to start to look at the, the bylaws. Thank you. That will be during the transition time. They'll make some of those decisions. Go ahead, Larry. Larry, management consistent. Eric, I'm not sure I got my question answered. Were you, or I missed it? Were you willing to change that one to your term, two from two to one? Just in the, in the, in the to be clear, which, which particular section, just to make clear what thought was. So no, no, no officer shall serve more than two consecutive terms in office. Of course, each term is two years. Correct. So I would like to see that change to one two year term as opposed to two. I mean, if you're willing to do that. Larry, I don't feel that I can. Um, this was a huge part of the recommendation from the special committee. And I, I don't feel I can make that change. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me. As it's still being Eric's motion at this point, he's not willing to change, which is okay, <laughs> which is okay. No, I, and I understand your your reasoning, but if Larry wishes to pursue this, then he can turn that into a motion. And then this board would vote on that motion as to whether you want to leave that statement in or you want it reduced to one term in any office. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Matt, go, um, go ahead. Matt Ackley, and I'm a member of the uh, Constitution and Bylaws Committee. As Tom and I have read the motion, and the, the amendment is currently worded each term 
as an executive council member, regardless of whether they are an officer, is two years. If you are elected with the wording that's currently in the, in the amendment, you would be elected to the executive council for two years. If you serve a year and then are named as an officer, you will serve as that officer for no more than one year unless you're reelected to the council. That is the current wording in the proposed amendment. Yeah. Larry Benjamin, District President. Okay, how I'm reading is no offer social service serve more than two consecutive terms in any office. So that would mean, as I read it, whether it be the vice president, president, secretary, treasurer, cannot serve more than two consecutive two-year terms. So the council membership is what's elected to a term. And while the IBT selects the officers from among the council, they still have a two-year term on the council of which a year has passed. They can be elected as an officer by the IBT. I understand. I the council members first. I understand that, yeah. Okay, we've gone over a 20 minute limit on this discussion. We still want to continue discussing this further. Okay, we'll put it up for another 20 minutes. Okay. When 20 minutes hits it, thus that blue card comes up. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Go ahead, Bill. No? Well, not on the proposed amendment. I'm just waiting my turn. <laughs> so, the proposed amendment is going to be left like he said. Uh, if anyone else wants to offer a friendly amendment, I believe now is the time. Now's the time we do it. Right. Yep. So, while we didn't agree, I would like to offer a friendly amendment uh, that we uh, in the Article 8, uh, Section, I'm sorry, let me get to it. I was, okay, in Article 7, Section 5, I would like to append the words, or in an office, comma, other than that of president, comma, in a WBCCI entry club. That would cause section two to now read as follows. Section five, a member of the board of trustees shall hold no international, regional, or local club office or position other than that office or position which places him on said board. Nothing herein contained shall disqualify an international officer or regional officer from service upon standing or special committees or in an office other than that of president in a WBCCI intra club. Yes, I, I accept that. I, I accept that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Bill. That's yours. So that you have it. So that Eric can add that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there any other questions from the audience or anybody else? Any other friendly amendments that need to come forward? Any unfriendly ones? Questions completed. So this motion will require a majority vote in the affirmative to pass. The motion proposes forwarding to the Constitution Delegates meeting in July of 2022 a constitutional amendment to delete Article 7 officers and their election and Article 8 Board of Trustees and insert a new Article 7 Board of Trustees and Article 8 International Officers. Are you ready for the question? We made some change. So. Uh, 
has a new name. Okay. Article eight has a new name. Executive Council. No, however. Just the last part. Just the last sentence. Okay, so instead of international article, international officers, section eight would read executive council. Do I need to read that whole thing again for you folks? You understand that? Okay. Are you ready for the question? This is not what we should be doing, but it's a new process. Mary, <laughs> do you want to make the most? Okay. Okay. The vote is now on motion 1-R1 as read and amended, okay? Without objection, motion 1-R1 as amended will be approved. Objection, Christopher Sepp, Region 5. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We need a roll call vote. will be done in random order sequence. Can you hear me? Nope. Can you hear me now? Let me turn it on. There you go. Sorry, I'm hitting the wrong thing. First Vice President, Eric McHenry. Yes. Region nine, Bill Miller. Yes. Region eight, Greg Badner. Yes. Region six, Larry Madden. No. Second VP, Pear Hamquist. Yes. International Recording Secretary, Linda Shelton. No. Region 10, Kathy Geesey. Yes. Third VP, Karen Fisher. Yes. Region two, RJ Marquette. Yes. What did he say? Yes. yes. He said yes. Region 11, Ken Johansson. No. Region five, Christopher Seplek. No. Region one, Doug Hart. Yes. Region seven, Jane Carmichael. Yes. Immediate past president, Ann Green Selkin. Yes. Region three, Bill Wild. Yes. Region 12, Laverne McHenry. Yes. Region four, Brad Briggs. Yes. Right, do that. No, I don't. Okay. Yeah. 13. Vote is 13. Yes. Four no's. The A's have it. Can we go home? Okay. Uh, no. Hearing of the motion 1 R 1 is approved and we forward it to the membership. Okay. Okay. Yes. We're going to take a 10 minute break. <laughs> Cocktails in the back. <laughs>
executive committees at the international, region, local club, and inter club levels, and designated leaders of national rallies and caravans the authority to set health and safety policy, including vaccination policy for rallies and caravans under their immediate jurisdiction. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Laverne. Please read your proposed impact, background, and financial impact statement, please. The purpose impact statement reads, transfer of decision-making in regards to health and safety policies, including vaccination policy, to the governing board slash leaders of events who are most knowledgeable about the venues, events, geographical and transportation risks, of, et cetera, of specific rallies and caravans that may pose a higher level of exposure to attendees. For events where the governing board slash leadership believes local or state policies are sufficient, no additional policies need be applied. Background statement reads, current policy that proof of COVID vaccination or exemption from vaccination may not be used as a prerequisite for attendance at any official ACI slash WBCCI event was adopted prior to knowledge of the impact of COVID on rallies and caravans. The significantly more contagious Delta variant impacted the health and safety of caravan and rally participants, which necessitated a review of the policy. Eric McHenry, excuse me, Eric McHenry, co-sponsor. Financial impact, if this motion is approved at the winter IBT and changes in policy for individual rallies slash caravans follow, all marketing and registration information must be clear about the vaccination policy at a specific event. If a vaccine policy for a particular event is not announced until after registration and would prevent someone who is already registered from attending, a full refund will be issued. With long waiting lists for caravans and rallies, it is anticipated this will have minimal financial impact. Are there any questions or discussion concerning this motion from the board? Gregory? Yes, uh, <clears throat> Greg Badner, Region 8. I have a friendly amendment I'd like to read. Okay. I'd like to read the entire thing just so there's no confusion. The first part is the same as Kathy's original motion. The Airstream Club International urges all regions, clubs, and intra clubs to follow their local health and safety guidelines, including COVID guidelines for any gatherings, rallies, or caravans. Additional health and safety policies, including vaccination policies for specific events, are at the discretion of the executive committees with approval of two thirds of their members voting on the vaccination policy at the region, local club, and intra-club levels. Additional health and safety policies, including vaccination policies for national caravans, are at the discretion of the designated leader of the national caravans after consultation with the national caravan leader. Such policies must be part of the caravan registration process. Thank you. I, I might mention some of you have a printed copy. You should strike the word international. It's in about the middle of the paragraph. If you have that printed, I don't have one. that is not part of my motion. <laughs> All right. Or if you just read it. <clears throat> Okay, any other board members? Oh, wait. Okay. That was a friendly, that was, that was a friendly motion. motion. So we need to ask Kathy if she's willing to accept that. Kathy, are you willing to accept that? I'm willing to accept that. Okay, any other board members uh, with I, questions? Question. First, we'll go to Brad Briggs. Uh, I'd like to hear one more time. It was read to us, we don't can read it. I'd like to hear one more time. Can you reread that friendly motion one more time? And could you maybe start with what's being added? Sure. Tell us what's being added and then read it. Yeah. Let me pull it up on my screen here. So I'll 
I'll read the first part, but it's the same. The Airstream Club International urges all regions, clubs, and interclubs to follow the local health and safety guidelines, including COVID guidelines for any gatherings, rallies, or caravans. Additional health and safety policies, including vaccination policies for specific events, are at the discretion of the executive committees. And this is new, the following is new, comma, with approval of two thirds of their members voting on the vaccination policy. And then it goes back to the original at the, and then Stripe International, at the region, local club, and intra club levels. And, <clears throat> and the rest of this is new. Additional health and safety policies, including vaccination policies for national caravans, are at the discretion of the designated leaders of national caravans after consultation with the national caravan leader. Such policies must be part of the caravan registration process. Go ahead, Eric. Mine was essentially the, the, the same as Brad's. Just to, I just been a long morning. I apologize. Just because it's so important to understand. What's the gist of it? Not the language, but just the gist. Of it. Not the language, just the gist of, it, of the amendment. Uh, sure. The gist of it is to, I would say, low, allow local decisions where the decision makers are closest to the issues where their event or rally is going to be held, and what their membership would be interested in, propose, uh, a vac if they do propose a vaccination policy, it would then have to be approved by two thirds of the members, all members being given an opportunity to vote, but two thirds of the actual voters. And then as far as the, and that would hold true for regional, uh, intra club, local club uh, rallies and events. <clears throat> the caravans I've separated out into a separate section because they are somewhat distinct and different, and they move across the country in different circumstances. So, in that case, I'm uh, proposing that the caravan leader have the authority to designate a COVID policy for that caravan after consulting with the national caravan leader, and I would assume that whoever, whether it's John or anyone else, would have a good discussion with them and it would come out with a proper policy. I trust our leaders. And the important thing there is that if they do implement a COVID policy, immunization policy, that it be clearly stated in the registration process. The benefit of that is you're not going to have a situation where people enroll in the caravan and then at the last minute they drop out because, oh my God, uh, they're not all going to be vaccinated or, oh my God, they're all going to be vaccinated or even worse, they get into the caravan and then drop out because of some issue. <clears throat> it's clear up front. They don't want to do it. They can go on another caravan and do a different event. So that, that's the rationale. Thank you. Larry, do you have? No, I'll just wait until you go for that. Karen? Um, Greg, Kathy, I would like to suggest one change, and this is really just a clarification and use of proper terminology, but rather than National Caravan Leader, he's actually the chair of the National Caravan Standing Committee. I'm not perfectly willing to <laughs> I just don't want somebody to say, well, who's this national caravan leader? Where's the national caravan going? Whatever. So. I'm new here, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> Any more questions from the board? Okay. From the reading? Oh, go ahead. I, do, is there an opportunity to hear from the national caravan chair? Want to get down through here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the um, from the region vice presidents. From the audience. <laughs> uh, 
John Becker. I'm the, uh, <laughs> the chair, chair of the caravan standing committee. <laughs> no, I, no, I would say it's, uh, for, as, as I said two days ago, this isn't an easy issue. Turn on your mic, please. Thank you. John Becker, I'm the chair of the standing caravan committee. Uh, as I said two days ago, this, this isn't an easy issue for all of you or for leaders of rallies, but also especially caravan leaders. And I, I'm happy with the amendment that the caravan leaders can consult with me. Uh, and as I said two days ago, while not every caravan leader would require vaccination on their caravan, they feel they should be able to make the call based on the nature of the activity where they're going, how long it is, et cetera. And, uh, and I still stand by that. And I, with the amendment, you know, I'll consult with the leader on, on what the right call is. Uh, I, I, I do get some favorable feedback on using the same two thirds, you know, uh, of, of polling the people who are signed up and saying, okay, if more than two thirds want to do this as at a rally, or if a local club was having a rally and have the same decision can work because I do also like getting that feedback from the members. And I think in some cases, two thirds would say, yeah, that's, uh, that's what they want. So it's, go ahead. <laughs> yes, I'm here. How, how can you consult to two thirds of members who have yet to sign up if we represent the policy that applies to a particular caravan before it's years possible to register. You don't know. Well, true, but what we would do is, you know, for this year's caravans, people have registered. And so the first thing a caravan, if this passes, the first thing a caravan leader, if it required two thirds is, you know, you could, you can like four Cajun caravan, Peter Schwartz, the leader would go to, here's all the people who are on the list. Most of them have already paid and have to go through and say, get all the feedback. And, and I've recommended one person, one vote, because we do have a lot of single travelers on caravans. Uh, so doing it one person, one vote. And if two thirds say we want this to be that way, I know in my discussions with Peter, he's in favor of doing that, of, of requiring vaccination. And in, in that way, then if it was more than two thirds, we would then quickly, fortunately that caravan has a long waiting list. So if, since there are perhaps, if, if our club demographic is similar to what the CDC says about the country as a whole, just over 90% of people who are age 65 to 75 are vaccinated, you ought to expect 10% of the people who have signed up on the caravan to say, well, I can't go now, so you have to issue me a refund in line with the policy that was set. And so there would be a, especially for the early caravans, uh, like Cajun in March, like Roland to the Big Easy, Springtime in Kentucky, all the ones that were on the list that are in my report, because it is roughly chronological, there would be a scramble then to bring people in from the wait list as quickly as possible. But it would have to be broadcast. This was the decision of the caravan participants. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hold on, but I got Joe Bornski on the Zoom call. Joe Peplinski, um, Historical Committee Chairman, member of the uh, Southeastern Michigan Airstream Club. I have trouble with the wording of the friendly amendment that was just posed, where it was talking about a vote of two thirds of the members. I would interpret that mean if you want a policy on a national caravan, you need two thirds of the members of the international club to vote on that. If it was a region activity, you'd need two thirds of the region members. If it was a local club activity, you'd need two thirds of the members of the local club. I think that needs to be reworded to be participants. People have signed up for interest, but using the word members is far too broad. Mm -hmm. RJ was next. Well, right. Hold on, RJ. You need to ask Kathy if she would accept Kathy, that. would you accept that friendly amendment? Can you paraphrase that a little bit for me? John, can you paraphrase that for her? It, it, it's hard to paraphrase because I can't remember the friendly amendment that was read, but it, it asked for a two thirds of, of approval of all the members, not of the participants or the people that have signed up for the activity. I'm not sure what the right term is, but I think members is far too broad. 
it should be two thirds of the participants, Kathy, instead of the membership, it should be two thirds of the participants. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, I'm not sure that we're, as far as my friendly amendment, the caravans are separate and there's no vote. I mean, there's a consultation and so forth. When John talked about the possibility of a vote, is that a friendly amendment, John, or was that just a conversation? Because that is a critical issue. And currently what's on the, the floor is, does not include the caravan members vote. And it doesn't so say- What you did as a friendly reminder does not have the caravans making a vote on it. It's up to right. the leader and to the international chair for the caravans. That's their decision. That's so you right. wouldn't need two thirds of the vote of the caravan is what you're stating. What I'm saying is two third vote is for region, local club, and intra club rallies and events. The caravans is up to the discretion of the caravan leader with consultation with the national caravan chairman. And then they also must uh, publicize that or make that clear in the registration process. I think John has a good point about the caravans that are already registered. So I and some other people are trying to have participants voting of caravans voting. It became very complicated because generally you would register, you would want to know that at registration. Right. So it's kind of a sticky issue. Okay. Um, I'm okay with the amendment with the amendment as it's written that the caravan leader can decide and it will and it, it will it will be for since the caravans are pretty much full for this year you saw the list and it will be the caravan leaders will have to go out and communicate that the leader has consulted me and here's the decision for a specific caravan uh and give an opportunity then for people who say well i'm basically if if the decision is it can go both ways if they say i'm not going to require and i know i know there are some leaders who would do this i know there are some leaders who would not do this they would say, I'm not doing it no matter what. Well, there may be people who say, well, then I want off the caravan because I'll go on one where it is being required. So, okay. I would like to point out, Mr. Chairman, this does not require a different COVID policy. This is just if the local club or if the caravan leader feels that it's important to do that. So in many cases, nothing will change from today. Okay. But, but, I, but I would say, it, he reiterates, and something that many of the leaders have told me, it is very important that we emphasize we will follow the local rules and caravans go through many jurisdictions and that that should be the expectation of everybody on the caravan. And, and if you're not willing to do that, you shouldn't go on the caravan. And the caravan leaders very much support that because then if you don't like the indoor mask rule in a state like New Mexico, it's not the caravan leader who decided that it was the Department of Health with the governor who decided that and but we will follow the local rules. Okay, thank you. Okay, RJ Dominic. Um, you all know my opinion on this. You all know my opinion on this. I'm not going to reiterate it. Um, if this policy goes through and the caravans or local government um, vote or decide that they're going to do this, who is going to be the one to police this? I don't need comments. Um, if you require to get the COVID card, does that person who requires it or club, do they realize that they're becoming the caretaker of your medical records? COVID cards are medical record. It is still accessible. You can still get information off of it from when you first got it. What happens if the medical records, that COVID card information is lost or your computer's hacked? Okay, who's gonna be responsible for it? What happens if you get a discrimination grievance because somebody is torqued because they got kicked off because they don't have the vaccination? Maybe they can't get a vaccination. Okay, maybe they have a medical reason they can't. I'm not talking about religious exemptions. I know people who cannot get it because they have a medical condition that prevents it. 
are we gonna require flu shots? We all know that the flu is more deadly than COVID at times. My last comment is, no matter if you're vaccinated or not, you can still get COVID, you can still be a carrier, you can still spread it. Okay, look around in this room. How many people, if we're gonna do this, are we gonna require everybody in this room to be wearing a mask? That's what it comes down to. Ask these people, do they wanna wear a mask? You can see who's wearing a mask and who's not. Thank you. Thank you. Not happening. Gotcha. Matt Hackney, Southeastern Camping Unit and uh, Caravan Leader, North to Alaska. I wanna read a portion of our Code of Ethics. Be ever mindful of what we say or print with respect to the effect on others so as to avoid disharmony and ill feelings among club members. I believe this gives us a lever for two thirds or more of the membership of any given group to cause disharmony with others who may not feel the way they do. I believe that getting the vaccine, getting the shot is a personal choice that we all make or choose not to make. And that it is not my job to protect someone who chose not to get it or could not get it. It is my job to protect me. And I've made that decision. And so I would encourage you all to vote this in the negative and not implement additional requirements that health officials and government officials have not already imposed. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Hey, when you're Karen Fisher, International Third Vice President. I want to go back to Joe Fuglinski's comment about changing the word members to participants. Um, I never did hear whether they agreed to that or not, but I would like to suggest that you do not agree to it because that implies that you can't get the vote until after everybody's registered. So it needs to be the membership of the local group, local club, region, whatever. <clears throat> and they pull their members and say, for example, at this region rally, you know, vote yes or no for whatever a policy would be, and it's done before the registration stuff goes out. Just hold on one minute, please. Um, our 20 minute time limit is up. Um, would you like to carry this on for a few more moments on this? Yes, please. Yes. yes. Okay. The next person up is Gail um, Power. Um, another 20 minutes. Okay. okay. Harrow, Gail Harrow on the Zoom call, you're next. Hi, Gail Harrow, Alberta, Saskatchewan unit and leaders of the Northern Lights and Polar Bears Caravan. I would like to strongly recommend to the club that they change the wording from the Airstream Club International urges to the Airstream Club International recommends to all regions, clubs, and interclubs to follow their local health and safety guidelines. I don't think urges, I think it should be a recommendation from the club. And with the caravan, um, we have to follow, you know, our country, our province, all, and our local health rules and regulations, which right now state that in order to even cross the border into Canada, you must be fully vaccinated. You must provide proof of vaccination. So the Northern Lights and Polar Bear Caravan will be run with only those people who are fully vaccinated. Also the trip from Thompson to Churchill via, by via rail, if there's another requirement there that all all participants must be fully vaccinated. And the same with our Churchill tour provider, all of the particip participants must be fully vaccinated. So there's, there's no two thirds approval of participants because that just will not happen up here. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Kathy Giesi. Um, I wanna address a couple of the comments that were made over here. 
precedent has been clearly set about. Hold on, we're back to oh. changing the friendly amendment from the word urge, urge oh. to oh. Recommend. Yes. recommend. That's what we need to see if you're accepting that first. I'm accepting that. Okay, hold on one minute because I got some more of the people ahead of you yet that make comments yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Larry. Larry's next, and then you're right after Larry. <laughs> Larry Van Green, six president. Okay. Indulge me while I get into the weeds. Not yet. Oh, yes. I'm yes sorry. Larry, you're next. Yes, I get into the weeds momentarily. Uh, first of all, Larry, power, real or perceived, is the most intoxicating thing on earth. Now, this motion clearly says it gives the uh, leaders of the national rallies, chairmen, and authorities to set health and safety policies including vaccinations policies. So let's say for an example that a particular rally decides that we want everybody to wear masks. So one, how is that gonna be enforced? Two, if you don't comply and they catch you with your mask off a couple of times, you ask to leave the rally. And, and I know this is trivial, but it's, it's what we're getting ourselves into. The national policy we adopted last year, I think covers this adequately. Again, local and state regulations and policies. I, I really think you're, you're opening a can of worms here and it's uh, not a good deal. Not that I don't care for people's health, mind you, but um, I, I think the club's setting itself up for a real issue. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? Hi, Lisa Sly with the Vintage Airstream Club and I'm just coming back to that from, a, from an inter-club perspective. I'm still coming back to that two thirds vote. Is it a vote? Is it a poll? Is it, is it after you sign up for, let's say a VAC rally? I, I'm still very vague what you mean by that. And I really think that needs to be clarified a lot better. And uh, I don't agree with any of this topic. I think we should leave it the way it is. Nobody's business. That's my two cents. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, you're next to talk. Um, um, <clears throat> oh, okay. okay. No, I don't think I'm next. <laughs> Because I, I want to respond to some of this, but I think we. You were the next one to speak. You can speak now on. This is not on your amendment. You, you were trying to do when, when you began talking about it without the amendment, friendly uh, amendment. It's your turn to talk now. Okay. Okay. So I, I want to respond to a couple of these comments in that, uh, you know, the concern about, gosh, we've got control of, of people's medical records. Precedent has been clearly set. Um, concert, uh, I'm trying to think of the big, the big one. They're now requiring proof, proof. You have to show your vaccination card. Uh, restaurants, I ate at a restaurant recently, was not allowed to be seated until that. So, so this is not something that we're, we're leading the way on this. This is something that is established and is unfortunately uh, become part of what we have to do to keep ourselves and others safe. Um, I also, if, is, is this a time, can I sh share what the call will sent to me? Is this an appropriate time for that? Okay. So, um, I don't, I think a lot of you probably know Darlene and Bob Caldwell. They are members of Region 10 and have also been incredibly active in this club for a very long time. Uh, Darlene sent me an email a couple of days ago and she said, please, please make sure that everyone understands this. This motion is about allowing leaders the decisions based on local circumstances, which may include hospital limitations and quickly changing local restrictions created not only by local legislation, but also by venues. This motion is not about dogs limiting participation nor establishing unique long-term rules. Caravan or rally leaders want events to be 100% full, want happy and healthy campers who can participate, fully not having to sit out, and no leader wants negative comments or complaints after an event. Participants appreciate clearly defined guidelines or protocols, be it parking, camping requirements, or COVID protocols. My final, final comment is the criticism about that uh, the Airstream Club um, recommends, urges all regions, clubs, and intra-clubs to follow their local and health and safety guidelines, including COVID guidelines. That's part of our current policy. That's not, I literally copied that out of there. So that's already what we're doing. We're not, again, we're not bringing anything else in 
Um, I didn't dream that one up. That comes out of our local policy, our current policy. Thank you, Kathy. Go for one, please. So mine. This time I get to unmute myself. Joe Peplinski, um, Southeastern Michigan Club, Club Historian. I'm sorry, the, the, my previous comments got misinterpreted as being applied to caravans. I, I, I'm sorry that I don't see the words in writing of the friendly amendment, but the way I interpret the friendly amendment was for every club activity, we would have to poll all of our members and get a two thirds vote to either say, vaccination is required, not required or whatever. It sounds to me like you're forcing a two thirds vote for every activity this club will, will put forth. And I don't think that's manageable. I'm not, I'm not talking for or against changing the policy we've got. I think the two thirds is totally unmanageable. It's forcing a vote for every activity. Thank you, Joe. Cecilia, I'm lying on the Zoom call. The city stands very good. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, um, I agree with Matt and several other people that have stated, I think this is a very dangerous area for, oh, I'm Cecilia Stansbury, past Region 12 president, current vice president of the Lake Tahoe Airstream Club. I live in a different area than a lot of you. We have very few restrictions in Nevada. We have very few cases in Nevada. I think that situation is in many areas of our country. There are many areas that are more heavily populated that do have stronger uh, regulations. I think we should leave it the way we've done and leave it up to the local areas and what regulations. I know I've talked to several leaders of caravans and they've gone with what the policy is. I think we're leaving ourselves really wide open for people, um, dissension in the club, number one. Number two, liability of the club, because if two thirds of a caravan decides that they want everybody to have a vaccination card, that third of the caravan potentially could say, you know, I'm, I'm mad. I, you know, I, for one thing, can't physically maybe get a vaccination card. If there's an area like Gail Harrower said, Canada is another uh, area that we have to get, go across the border. You have to be vaccinated. So you would not sign up for a caravan had you not had a vaccination. You would not have, uh, um, signed up for that caravan. But if you signed up for a caravan that you know is in an area where masks are required, possibly indoors or something, if you're not comfortable with that, you're not going to sign up for that caravan. But to make the requirement, I think, is really, really a dangerous policy for our club. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna extend this for 10 more minutes and then we gotta wrap this up, but we still have a few people that would like to talk. Sir, you're next. Is this on? No. Is it on? It's on. Okay. I'm John Thibodeau, I'm, I'm just a member. Uh, I'm a past uh, caravan leader, retired, I guess. Um, I, I think you guys need to tread very, very carefully with this issue. Uh, sitting in the back listening to this, it sounds like we're trying to turn ourselves into a police department. Amen. And uh, as a past Amen. caravan leader, I, I don't want to go around to individuals and tell them whether or not to wear a mask. I don't want to look, uh, look at people's vaccination cards to see what they've got. I would trust them to, to tell me. I think it's very important to follow the rules and guidelines of the areas that we might be traveling in or having a rally in. But in order and to, to turn this into a police type issue is very, very dangerous for the club. And I really would hate to see that happen. Uh, I, I think probably the existing rules uh, are, are sufficient to take care of the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Tom Smithson. Uh, Tom Smithson speaking as a member of the Northern California Airstream Club. 
unfortunately, this particular issue has become exceedingly politicized, which is unfortunate. Tom, can you stay near the mic, please? <laughs> yeah. I think that this issue has become exceedingly politicized, which is very unfortunate, because really it's the question of health and safety. That's really the issue. And it's also a question of responsibility, as I've said earlier when this, in earlier discussions about this. Health and safety is a part of the responsibilities of the club. We don't lead our members into locations or activities which are going to endanger them in any way, shape, matter, or form, or hopefully we don't. <clears throat> On the other hand, the, the fact that we have individuals within the club who are unvaccinated who may potentially be a carrier of the COVID virus, and they are included in our activities, and they don't or are not responsible the people who they're having this activity with is to me a problem. This particular motion is not mandating anything of anyone, and nor is it asking for the entire 200 members of my particular local club to make a decision about whether our activities will be dictated by uh, some COVID policy. It's simply saying is that if there is an activity, the participants of that particular activity need to have some input about the level of responsibility of the people who there will be associated. That's all it's asking. If it were a mandate, I probably would be objecting to it, but it's not. It's trying to give the members a choice in their relationships with the other members of a particular activity be it a caravan, be it uh, a rally, be it whatever. And I think that that's valuable. We're not trying to be cops. I'm not gonna go around and tell you that you should wear a mask because the local club, or pardon me, the local regulations when you walk into a building, big sign on the door that says, you must wear a mask to enter here and you don't wear one. I know what I'd like to do, but I won't do it because I'm not a cop. I just think that the person who's not wearing a mask is particularly irresponsible. And I don't have any respect for them. And I stay as far away from them as I possibly can because they could very well be a carrier of the COVID virus. Now, should we or should we not? We, we have a policy right now which says mandates, okay? It mandates that we can't do something. This one does not do that. What it does, it gives us the option, that lo local option, to make a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Do we want to extend that? I don't think so. Yeah, she's on the way to prepare for it. Oh, that was blue. That was blue. Okay. Millie, you're next. Okay. First of all, I was a cop. You don't want to be a cop. <laughs> Let me just put that out there. Trust me, it's not a happy day. You identify where you're Excuse me, Millie O'Donnell, Southeastern Camping Unit President, former cop. <laughs> There's a couple points I just want to make real quick before she starts waving flags back there. Number one, no offense to anybody, but my little vaccination card, you guys can see it. There's nothing on it. There's nothing you can get from it, except that I'm really not Millie, I'm Mildred. And oh, well, it's, it's not a, it doesn't have any of you on it, I promise. Um, that being said, my daughter and her husband are both suffering from COVID, knock wood, mild cases, because they are fully vaccinated and boosted. It can happen. It happens a lot. We have a few members in our unit who have been vaccinated and have still gotten this delightful thing, which is hopefully on the downside. I've heard caravan leaders talk about, if you don't make a change to the current rules, we don't wanna be caravan leaders anymore. I've also heard caravan attendees say, if you're gonna tell me I have to do this, I'll just go on my own. I hate to see the club lose the money, lose all those big waiting lists for caravans because people really do wanna go. I think our current status is good. I really do. 
I think in a perfect world, we'd all be vaccinated and protected because dear God, I love people. But it's not my job to tell you how to take care of your health. Thank you. We're gonna to go to one more Zoom person and then Kathy, you'll be after him, okay? So Bill Bryan. Hi, yeah, this is Bill Byram. I'm the president of the Piedmont Airstream Club in North Carolina. Uh, just a couple of points. One, uh, I don't see that this two thirds thing is manageable from any standpoint. Uh, as a club, how would we ever uh, be able to solicit, you know, uh, for a rally or any, any activity? I also urge all the voting members to vote against this amendment. Uh, the current amendment covers everything we can you know we talked about this extensively at in uh at the last rally at the last international in uh lebanon and basically it's up to the individual to to protect themselves and protect their health uh as the previous speaker said lots of people with uh that are fully vaccinated are, are getting COVID or getting this latest uh variant and for someone to say, well, if you're if you're vaccinated, you're not going to carry any kind of, uh, you know, you're not going to make me sick. Well, that's not true. You can still make somebody, you can still give it to somebody. So we just need to address this uh, with the current policy. Uh, and, you know, going forward, if we went forward with this, what's the end point and what's fully vaccinated? Uh, at some point, I guess I've heard that they're going to, say, well, you get a flu shot, you get a COVID vaccine or a COVID shot at the same time. So are we going to have to prove that we had that shot? Uh, I think it's a slippery slope to go down. And one final point about caravans, and I've talked with John Becker, or he and I have emailed about this, you know, it was brought up that, well, caravan leaders take people to remote areas and, and they're worried about making them sick in remote areas. The only thing I'd be worried about in a remote area is having a heart attack or some life-threatening event. You're never so far away in this country that, that you can't get to a hospital or to some medical facility, and COVID is not a life-threatening event immediately. I'm not saying that people don't die from it, but certainly if you come down with symptoms of COVID, it's not likely you're going you're to die within the next hour. And certainly you can get to some facility that can treat you or give you uh, medications for this. So I urge, uh, I urge the voting members to vote against this amendment and to vote for, uh, to just keep it the same way that it is. Thank you. Time limit is up on this again, please. End it again. Okay. okay, our time limit. We've gone through almost 50 minutes on this discussion, okay? Do we want to extend it for another 10 minutes? No. 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 Okay. Okay, I've got two more people on my list and then that'll end. Okay. The question, at some point, can we present the final revision of the motion for us to look at? Because I think part of the confusion right now is that we have a number of accepted amend changes to it, and we're like trying to keep all the balls in order. So what we'll do is we'll go through these few people we have left. We will have Kathy read it with the friendly amendments in it, and then we will see it. Okay, um, would that work for you? Because there's no way yeah, of us. I was proposing perhaps that we can get it up on the screen. You know, Probably so won't be able to revise do. it. And what we're looking at. On the there's screen. no way. There's no way we can get it up on the screen. Do it that way. Okay. Um, okay, Kathy, you go ahead right now. Pardon? Go ahead. You had your hand raised earlier. Okay. For... Um, a couple things that I think some people have missed on this, and it's a very important part of this, is that the additional health and safety policy, again, the very first of this was taken out of our current policy. Then I added additional health and safety policies, including vaccination policies, for specific events or at the discretion of the executive committees. I'm not, if your executive committee says, you know, our membership doesn't care about that, we don't. All we're asking is that for the, the executive committees in regions where they do care about this, where they do want this implemented, that they have the option of doing it. 
Nobody is mandating anything on this. We are allowing our members in those regions that do care about it to have a say in how the rallies and caravans are run by the two thirds vote. Okay. Thank you. Doug Hart from Region One. Not require. Hmm? Not require. Not required. I didn't see the allow. I saw allow, but I didn't know. Uh, we're going to require the caravans. Are we? Okay, sorry. Out of turn. Thank you. Direct all the questions for me, please. Doug Hart. Um, maybe, maybe this is the final comment, but from my observation, this is going to be a very close vote. And I think that in and of itself, given the nature of this topic, is going to be divisive whether it passes or fails. And I wonder if Kathy would consider withdrawing the motion. Kathy would be willing to withdraw her motion. Kathy, you can answer that. I will not withdraw the motion. Okay. I think I can get it up on the screen. You can get it up on the screen. This is, this is the right. I don't want to change this. Just screen. give us one minute. Can you do that? Yeah, just a second. Okay. She's got... We'll have it up on the screen for everybody to be here in a minute so we can see it. I, I believe... No, we're not taking a small break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're trying to get it on the screen like you want it there. <laughs> He's just changing changes for us so we can do it. Can I take the opportunity to make a comment? We're done with the comment section. This is, I said, after Doug Hart was done, we're closing it out. We'll put it up on the screen so we can read it, and that will be it. And I'm sure that we can probably sit here all day and continue this discussion on for many more hours. <laughs> you can see me up there. No, I don't. Thank you for so putting it on. Okay, so there you go. Okay, we now have it up on the screen for everybody to see. Yeah. Greg, is it exactly what you want on your friendly event? Right, I'm trying to make it a little bit bigger. The word urges was changed, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, we agree. Kathy, did you accept the urgence to recommend it? Yes. Yes, okay. Recommends. And did we go with participants or did we leave it with members? Because participants aren't till afterwards and you want this done as part of the registration or. We had it. You originally said members. Yes. And I'm not agreeing to change it. And that's not really for the caravan aspect of it. That's for the rallies, the local. Yeah. Because again, you don't know who your participants are until it's almost too late. Yeah. That's what, so that so be mem with the approval of two thirds of the members. Okay. So that local club, let's say. Yep. Okay. So, yes, that looks. That looks correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you see it now? Okay. Go ahead, Lori. I know you want to talk. Yeah, I, I just want to be here all day, so I thought if I'd drink something else and talk to you things. But for approval, two thirds of why? Why wouldn't we put organizers or rally hosts or because that's who's organizing on the front end, right? We want to know what's happening on the front end if we're in. This town, we may have restrictions, that town not. So wouldn't it be the organizers setting these bars? Because it'd be, that's who's well, gonna set this up? I feel that if it's the organizers that are doing it, and I'm just trying to understand what you're saying, right? It would be the members that are hosting this rally would be the ones responsible for the two thirds membership. Because after the participants come in and we've all been to rallies in the last minute, they come in and we got Seven new trailers coming in, we do it to sell out. That would throw off who did the vote on it or the regulations then, right? Not not what I was saying. What I was saying is that it would be whoever's going to organize, for example, 
this rally. <laughs> Whoever's organizing this rally needs to be the one to set the standard because of the area they're in. Right, so it'd be the region now for this one. Or would I, you didn't let her him talk. Point of order. Okay. You didn't let him talk. You can't let her talk. Okay, I'm good. But she's trying to change the, the wording. No, out I'm good. Here. No, I'm good. Okay. I would draw. I would draw. Okay. Okay. We'll draw. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Everybody happy with what they see on the board up there? Or can they read it? Let me put it that way. It doesn't have to be happy. <laughs> this is the way Kathy and Greg wants to bring it forward. That's correct. Both okay. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, this motion will require a majority vote in the affirmative to pass. The motion proposed amending the curve. I thought we agreed if instead of national caravan leader, we would be the chair of the national caravan committee. Standing. Standing. Yes. We, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, John. Sorry. No, that's a good point. When? Committee. Yeah, and I'm going to go back to the National Caravan. Chair of the International National Caravan. That's not how you spell standing. Standing. That's a standing. Standing. I'm getting there. Oh yeah. Nice to know that the food trucks here, and we're still not, not even all the way down. <laughs> that much to go for. <laughs> okay, it's caravan canning. Excellent caravan scanning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Motion proposed amending the current WBCCI COVID policy to allow executive committees at the international, region, local club. Oops, we're taking out international. I'm sorry. Region, local club, and intra-club levels are designated leaders and designated leaders of the national rallies and caravans. The authority to set health and safety policy, including vaccination policy for rallies and caravans under their immediate jurisdiction. Are you ready for the question? Yes, no for the question. Okay. The vote is now on motion number three as read. Without objection, motion number three as read will be approved. Objection. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Okay. Who do I pick? So <laughs> we're down to roll call vote. Linda. Here we go. <laughs> Glad I printed up a lot of these. <laughs> so the vote is now on motion number three as amended. <laughs> just correct that before we do it. Okay. No, Trevor's not here. So okay. Trevor's not online, right? Okay. Okay. Region two, RJ Marquette. No. That only. How about here? There you go. RJ Marquette. No. No. Second VP, Pear Hamquist. Yes. International Recording Secretary, Linda Shelton, no. Region 12, Laverne McHenry. Yes. Region 6, Larry Madden. No. Region 11, Ken Johansson. Yes. Region 10, Kathy Giese. Yes. Third VP, Karen Fisher. No. Region 7, Jane Carmichael. Yes. Region 8, Craig Vadner, sorry. Yes. First VP, Eric McHenry. Yes. Region 1, Doug Hart. No. Region 5, Christopher Seplek. No. Region 4, Brad Briggs. Yes. Region three, Bill Wild. 
No. Region nine, Bill Miller. No. Immediate past president, Andrew Selking. No. This is a close one. The vote is eight yes, nine no's. The no's have. I do want to thank Candy for working so hard on that, being so no into this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> move on to motion for from Eric McHenry and request the granting of permanent club charter to the Grapes and Grains Interclub. Eric, can you please read your motion? I move that the WBCCI International Board of Trustees grant a permanent charter to the Grapes and Grains Interclub for WBCCI policy 16.6.6. .6 .6 Second. Is there a second? Second. Please read your proposed impact background and financial statement. Proposed impact, purpose slash impact. Interclubs allow WBCCI members to share lifestyle interests, such as vintage airstream, amateur radio, etc. The background on this one is Grapes and Grains is an interclub for members to share their interest in beverages that are produced from grapes and grains. These would include beverages such as wine, brandy, spirits, and beers, as well as recipes made from these beverages. Rallies and caravans would focus on tours to places that make these beverages, as well as enjoy venues that serve these beverages. The main objective of the membership is to share their knowledge about grapes and grains with others. The club will be open to all members whose interests lie within grapes and grains. Financial impact, done. Are there any questions or discussions concerning the motion from the board? From the region vice presidents? From the audience? This motion will require a majority vote in the affirmative to pass. The motion requests granting a permanent club charter to the Grapes and Grain Interclub. Are you ready for the question? The vote is now on motion number four as read. Without objection, motion number four as read will be approved. Hearing none, motion number four as read is approved. Motion number five is from Eric McHenry proposes granting a permanent club charter to the future streamers in the club. Eric, please read your motion. I move that the WBCCI International Board of Trustees grant a permanent charter to the future streamers intra club for WBCCI policy 16.6.6 intra club. Is there a second? Second. Okay, please read your proposed impact, your purpose, impact, background, and financial statement. Purpose and impact. Intraclubs allow WBCCI members to share lifestyle interests such as bitches, airstream, amateur radio, et cetera. Insights from Airstream Inc. has identified a growing number of Airstream owners who occasionally or always travel with young adults and children. This segment of Airstream owners also exists within WBCI, driving the goal of forming an intraclub focused on members traveling with youth, adults, young adults, or children. Background. Future Streamers is a club designed to keep youth involved in our Airstream adventures. Future Streamers Club is open to all members. Future Streamers are members that may travel with children. Our goal is to develop memories with our youth that excite them about Airstreaming, provide lifestyle opportunities, and building friendships through family friendly engagements and experiences. Using a private electronic forum, rallies, and informal social gatherings, 
our members can enjoy sharing common interests and challenges involved with traveling with children. Okay. Are there any questions or discussions concerning this motion from the board? Region Vice Presidents? Audience? This motion will require a majority of vote in the affirmative to pass. The motion proposed granting a permanent club charter to the Future Streamers Inter Club. Are you ready for the question? The vote is now on motion number five as read. Without objection, motion number five as read will be approved. Hearing none, motion number five as read is approved. <laughs> hey over there. <laughs> He's excited. <laughs> Is there any further new business? <clears throat> Hearing none, this January 20th, 2022 IBT meeting is adjourned. We will now have announcements from the board members. Please be mindful of the time. Really mindful. <laughs> <laughs> And a red card at three minute mark. Let's start with region. Let's go with region six. Nice. <laughs> Larry Matt, region six president. I do not have any notes for dates and times of what's happening in region six presently with me because I didn't prepare for it. However, uh, last year, even though COVID was a concern for everybody, we had three major, four major rallies in Region 6. Uh, a special event rally, which is held in Athens, Alabama, which is the old time Fiddler's Rally, had about 25 rigs show up, along with thousands and thousands of local people, because that, that event has been going on for many years. Uh, this rally was reinvigorated because it kind of died on the vine. Russ Fry and his wife uh, put themselves out there and they took it over for five years. And it's been very, very successful. Right after that, we zoomed to the Region 6 rally in Foley, Alabama, which was my first rally as a region president. And we had uh, roughly 50 ribs show up. Uh, it's a really, really nice destination. We had a great time uh, and great food. And after that, we went to El Dorado, Arkansas, where Jan Hebner, my vice president, is chair of a region uh, of a rally there. It's called the uh, Airstreams on the Square. And the local government in um, El Dorado just rolls out the red carpet for us. And I would invite anybody to look into it because it's been moved to October. It's much cooler. And we had a fabulous time. Uh, so that's it for Region 6. It's going to be kind of a repeat next year. And we're looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Region 7. <clears throat> Thank you. I want to say thanks to the organizers. I want to say thanks to the volunteers the facilities working out. And I want to look back just a little bit into 2021. We had a rally. We had to cancel 2020, so we just did a repeat. But we were lucky. President of the International Club, Ty Mott, came. Third Vice President, Karen Fisher, came. And these members went, how the hell did you get them to come here? <laughs> So I was arrested. <laughs> I was. I was put into handcuffs, right? Right. And I was put into prison stripes. Yeah. I was put on trial for murder. There was a jury, and my man Eddie was on it. He voted guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still paying for that one. <laughs> and I was released. Uh, they finally acquitted me, and here I am. So the good news is in 2022. We do have a first vice president, Ginger Slattery. You may call her Virginia or Ginger Slattery. She moved up. She was second vice president uh, installed by Ty and by Karen. She was second vice president for two months. She's now been first vice president for two months. <laughs> and she will soon be president. So I hope you'll all thank her when she's sitting in this chair. 
29, September 22 to September 25, we have folks already registered to attend. And I get to dump, I mean, I get to hand it over. <laughs> It'll be at the Jack Pine Lodge in the Hiawatha National Forest. And uh, Ginger's still putting it together, seriously. <laughs> Ginger has 10 years or more as an Airstreamer and came to it happily because she had uh, tented and done a pop-up before that. So thank you. I'll read your name. Oh, shut it off on you, didn't I? <laughs> thank you, Greg Bedford, Region 8 President. And uh, I'd like to introduce Rick Everson back there in the crowd, the first Vice President of Region 8. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone to our Region Rally. It's, uh, parking starts on Wednesday, April the 27th. It's at the Lancaster Event Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln is a very vibrant area. And we invite everyone to attend. The opening will be Thursday morning and it'll run through Sunday morning. So everybody's welcome to come. And thank you. Now you take care of her. She will be attending the rally. <laughs> and we are going to welcome the yes. <laughs> Okay, Region 9. Uh, Bill Miller, President of Region 9. Uh, I'd like to introduce my first vice president, Nancy Fitzgerald. We also have a uh, second vice president, Philip Vasquez, is uh, online uh, listening in. And I'd like to invite everybody to our first uh, uh, meeting rally for the last three years. We had to cancel the last two. Uh, April 26th to May 1st in Mineola, Texas. And we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to hold that one. Thank you. Go to Region 10. At the EC, Region 10. Uh, we had a very, very successful uh, region rallies last year, or, or I'm sorry, local club rallies. And this year, as far as I know, we already have 50. Um, scheduled for the upcoming. Our Region 10 rally is going to be June 1st through 5th, which is in Linden, Washington, which is just outside British um, Vancouver, British Columbia. We sold out in 36 hours. Uh, there's a lot of pent-up demand uh, for rallies in our area, for sure. And I think Terry shared with everybody that uh, the Oregon Airstream Club uh, have booked over 500 sites for this coming year. And they uh, are almost over 50% booked out on that already. Um, I would uh, like to thank both my first vice president who is attending uh, by Zoom, Darlene Caldwell. And, um, and then my second vice president is working full time. So she's gonna get to listen to this um, uh, on Zoom recorded later. But we had a, a great year last year. We're gonna have another great year this year. Thank you. Region 11? No. Nobody here? No. On screen? No. Oh, Ken, there you are. There I am. Uh, Ken Johansson, Region 11 uh, president. Um, I want to, in particular, thank uh, my great team that I get to work with uh, during these past two years. Uh, in particular, uh, Stephen Parr, who's attending the, who has taken the time to attend the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the rally here. Uh, John Holly, our second vice president, Barb Actor, our secretary, Nancy Fisher, who is our treasurer, Karen Birch here, who is our webmaster, and Bob Doster, who is our Blue, Blue Beret, uh, regist Blue Beret uh, editor. Um, we have two significant rallies within uh, Region 11. One is Balloon Fiesta. Uh, registration is going on this week. So far, we have 324 uh, registrations for 150 spots. Um, <laughs> that's that's going to be a challenge. To we do a lottery to to um, to figure out who's able to go or not. Anybody who doesn't make the lottery generally is uh, carried over to the following year. Uh, we also have our uh, Region 11 uh, rally that's coming up in March, and we have 
uh, 155 people signed up for 125 spots. <laughs> and, oh, oh, oh. So, uh, and we've got some really great entertainment uh, lined up. We were first night, we're doing a mariachi band and a taco bar. Uh, we're going to have a folk singer one night. Uh, we're going to have a national Nashville recording artist uh, one night. And then the last night we've got a, a, a nice uh, dinner and a, uh, a, one of uh, Phoenix's uh, premier uh, rock and roll bands. Uh, and so it's gonna be an epic event. And so got some great stuff going on in region 11. Thank you. Thank you, region 12. Laverne McKenzie, region 12. Uh, we have luckily or fortunately uh, weather out west is uh, pretty good for us, so almost year round. So we have not had to cancel our region mode uh, because we uh, conduct everything outside. We do not, we would not come into a clubhouse. All our meals, everything is done outside, happy hour, uh, shave ice, all that kind of stuff. So, we just come off a, a second year, you know, during COVID, having another successful uh, region rally, 120 was actually plus that uh, rigs uh, attended. Uh, we're going to continue to think outside the box. Uh, next year, uh, we are holding our region rally in September. It will be in San Diego. It's at the um, Bay Fair Thunderboat races. So we've secured another 120 sites where people will back up to the bay, the San Diego Bay, and have front row seats to the boat races. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, coupons coming up pretty quick uh, for registration. So if anyone's interested, it's uh, September 15th through the 19th. Thank you. Region one, Doug Hart. Thanks, Ty. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Bard Fuller and R.J. Dominic, uh, region one vice president and second vice president, respectively. They're both there in the room with you. Thanks, guys, for doing what I was unable to do. Um, region one is looking forward to welcoming a thousand airstreamers or a thousand airstreams to Freiburg, Maine, where earlier this week it was 14 degrees below zero. Uh, I'm told it's going to warm up by July, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, we have a lot of rallies before and after the the international rallies. So check out the website and feel free to join us. And lastly, um, if anyone is looking for local knowledge of the area, please feel free to reach out to me. And if I can't point you in the right direction, I'll sure connect you with someone who can. And uh, thanks to all of you for putting on a great IBT. Thank you, Doug. Uh, region two, RJ Marquette. Hello, region two, President RJ Marquette. Um, first, I'm sorry I couldn't make it. I was really looking forward to uh, to visiting Savannah for the first time ever. Uh, it looks like you guys are had a really good rally. We are planning our region two rally, the first one since 2019. It'll be May 19 to 22. Uh, we're having a joint rally with the Vintage Airstream Club. Um, it's at the Delaware State Fairgrounds in Hatterington, Delaware. So um, we should be able to handle, unless like a thousand Airstreams show up, we should be able to handle anything that, that uh, does appear. My cat is interested. Um, so <laughs> thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Region three, Bill Wild. Thank you. I'm Bill Wild, Region three. Um, I would, well, first I'd like to say thank you, Ty, for choosing Region 3 in Savannah for your rally. We were glad to have you here. I want to say thank you very much to John Leak again. <laughs> John told me that he ordered great weather for this week, but due to supply chain issues, it didn't find <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I would like to introduce 
uh, Chris Baum, who is my one VP. And I believe, although I can't tell because I can't see the participant list, that Bob Ely is probably online. He was for one of the earlier sessions. I don't know if he's here today. Um, we are going to have a region rally in April, from 6 to 10 April, in Hiawassee, Georgia, which is uh, at the Georgia Mountain Fairground. Um, it is um, uh, on Lake Chattook. We're calling it Silver on Chattook. It's just around the corner from Matt and Beth Hackney's house. Um, I would also like to say uh, welcome Karen, who's going to be our region rep I mean, our international representative. We're looking forward to having you there. Um, Freiburg, of course, ends on the 30th of July, I believe. Uh, so if you're looking for something to do as soon as Freiburg is over, uh, you have about a week to get to Galax, Virginia for the 86th annual Old Fiddlers Convention, which is being hosted by Joe and Christine Baum um, in Galax. And there will be information on the web about that soon. I think that's already out there on the, uh, on the event calendar. Uh, you don't want to miss that. That's, uh, that is a whole lot of fun, especially if you have a taste for bluegrass music. Um, we're planning on doing a caravan going up from the top of Georgia. Thank you. Um, if anybody from around the North Georgia area wants to join in on that, just please holler out to me. Um, and finally, shameless plug for my club, the top of Georgia, is if you want a place to stay before or after attending that region rally, um, top of Georgia would be happy to host you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Brad Briggs for Region 4. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so I would first of all want to thank uh, the Region 4 Vice Presidents. First Vice President Fred Keel, who's behind me. And second Vice President Mike Pasta, the wonderful people to work with have been very supportive of you. Uh, if you're in the Region 4 area, which includes the Lower Peninsula of Michigan, Ohio, and West Virginia, in the spring, we will have our Region 4 rally at Worcester, Ohio, which is about halfway between Columbus and Cleveland. And they're closing down their streets and opening up their town to air streamers. And the uh, registration just opened for all air streamers, whether they're affiliated with the club or not. And I'm happy to say we are two thirds full. So that's good news. Also, if you're around the Region 4 area in the fall, uh, just recently, a change has been made at the uh, Swiss Festival National Rally, which is the longest continuously scheduled rally in uh, WBCCI. Uh, Frank Keel has agreed to run that um, rally, and Region 4 is now the sponsor of that rally. So we expect it to go on for a long time. And that is September 25th through October 7th. So all is welcome. Please come to either or both events. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Chris for Region 5. Chris for Sedlock, Region 5. I'd like to thank my first vice president. And you guys see him again on his second go around through region. You know, his region officer is Artie Martin. He's going to join this board in July. And since the last IBT, we've gotten our second vice president. I want to thank John Deegan from the Central Indiana Group for um, stepping up and continuing on the presidency here in Region 5. I uh, also want to thank my wife for putting up with this, you know, going around the whole country. I love her to death, and she puts up with me. So, um, <laughs> Since our last IBT meeting, we've had our region rally in Warsaw, which I, considering the two before, I was absolutely thrilled that 33 trailers and 62 members showed up in Warsaw, Indiana. We had a great dinner, um, dinner boat ride on Lake Wawasee up there. It was fantastic. Uh, our next region rally is September 14th through 18th down in Madison, Indiana. Artie would 
gladly have you come and and that's a probably a little bit of a week before Sugar Creek, so you can stop in down in Madison and go over to Sugar Creek after that. So um, that's all I have to say. Thanks, and thanks, John. Tell them what Sugar Creek is. <laughs> oh, if you don't know what Sugar Creek is, it was a national rally, now it's a region rally. No, actually, sir, national. Sugar national. Creek is where the Swiss Festival National yeah. Rally is held. Oh. Okay, so, and thanks, John, for everything he's done this week. Thanks. Okay. Andy Selkin. I'm going to keep this short and quick. I'm just going to say I thank everybody for being here and sponsoring on this board. We have a great group here, and I know going forward that it's going to continue to get better. Other than that, I just think it's time to start having a Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Exactly. Uh, just real quick, another shout out to the team back at HQ. Thank you for uh, helping behind the scenes. I know we don't know, but they've been working this whole meeting while we've been here. So appreciate them. And again, if anybody's in Jackson Center, please stop at uh, headquarters and visit us. That's all. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Wow, we made it. Yay! I appreciate you all so much because we were working through this together. It's a learning process for all of us. We will continue to learn and we will continue to help each other. This has been a great experience, I think, for all of us, a learning experience. It just goes to show that we are all lifelong learners. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne. Is this on? Is it on now? now? Yes. Don't you do put a, put a red card. <laughs> <laughs> it's my time to shine. <laughs> <laughs> He'll pay for that dearly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to thank him, but I'm going to switch over to Lori and Joanne and thank them from the bottom of my heart for getting me through the first six months of this office, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so, and I want to thank my husband. He's my little chauffeur. And uh, I don't think he's in here anywhere, so I won't say anything bad. <laughs> but anyway... I love being here. I forgot the other night when we were talking, I didn't mention that I'm a second generation. My parents were members of this club, long time. And uh, I wish they were here to see this. I think they'd have been proud. All right, I'm gonna shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Karen. Um, I want to compliment everyone today. It's my great meeting. Joanne, I know you and Linda did a lot of work behind the scenes. Lori, you too are people at headquarters. And then all of the officers that are sitting here online um, would dedicate a lot of time to be here. Um, we listened well. We respected what other people said. Um, and we, we're going to go forward from here. So it's been great to work with all of you. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing that uh, through the rest of this term and, and hopefully beyond. Thank you, Karen. Here? Um, I'd like to this cool? <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank, thank the organizers for this event. It's fantastic. I would like to especially thank my friend John Lee for getting hooked on shorter introductions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank the, the team here for having a cordial discussion about the sensitive topic like COVID 19. We now know that the policy that was put in place before is a good one because it has support from the majority of the numbers. Um, I'm looking forward to having the national rally it's so close to home. It's been the first time in <laughs> over 20 years. So thanks again, everybody. Eric? Well, as I talk about what we've done since we saw you all last in, in Tennessee, y'all probably know that Laverne kind of sound like a reason six person now. Y'all do. That's how you join us. Y'all. Nothing wrong with that. But like, you know, so Laverne and I retired successfully. That's a little over a month ago. So we've been on the road 
but but we we were able to drop in to a southeastern Michigan Airstream Club rally, you know, after um, after Tennessee, and we just been on the map and contacted the, the president at the time, the rally leader. It had just a wonderful time there. It was truly uh, fantastic. And then we had a little bit further south and did the same thing. We just picked a pin on the map and it's been a wonderful weekend plus with the Pennsylvania Airstream Club at Pinwood. Again, through both of those places, we have. Uh, no surprise to y'all, but to, to know a, love a lot of new people in the club. Um, we went to Little Palooza, had a fun time at that over there by Jackson Center. Um, great time there. And as I mentioned, the last three weeks, uh, we have been pretty much with Region 6. We went to uh, Canover, and it's been a wonderful week with some of the, the Region 6 people after that. And of course, we're here now. Uh, we're going to be heading up to the Pins Rally um, up in Region 11. Uh, and then we're heading up through Washington. We may drop in on Region 10 if there's space, if there's space for us on our way, way back east. Um, I have to say, one of the highlights of our trip, and all that have been to headquarters will understand this, we spent, I don't think we, we stayed longer than we were welcome. And we were there about two or three weeks in and around Little Palooza, um, working with Lori and Deb and Barb and Amanda, you know, and, and um, Christy, and we really got to appreciate uh, firsthand what they do. Uh, they provide a tremendous level of support and they put us to work. Uh, Maroon and I uh, participated in folding new new member pamphlets. These are the big glossy brochures. And when Lori told me that the team did 70 last month, and I think we there are probably 20, it's really amazing at how much work the team does. So um, just a really wonderful time. Uh, thank you, Todd. Um, thank you, John. Uh, um, like Joanne said, that this has been a wonderful experience this last few days with y'all. I think we worked through a lot of things that I actually didn't think we'd work so we'd work through nearly as well hmm. together. So thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I want to thank Chris's wife. She has dog sat my dog for two days during these meetings. <laughs> Nice because I'll go home and she'll be exhausted from walking. Uh, I want to thank John and your team has done a tremendous job beyond what we were anticipating. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, really um, I want to thank RJ and E2 from headquarters for doing all the sound stuff with Lori. We've gotten through it. I know we had some problems, but we seem to have worked those out. Yay! <laughs> seeing everybody up there in Maine. I mean, we're getting close on those totals. Come up and join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so I'm going to make this short and sweet now. Happy hour is bring your own with you. It's at five o'clock outside. Dinner is at six. It's a low country boil. They're closing this hall up at eight o'clock. Is that right, John? Okay, at eight o'clock, this will be closed up. We need to get out of here so RJ's team can break this down so we have a little bit more room for dinner tonight. So everybody, thank you very much for doing this. Have a safe trip home. I will be leaving early in the morning, so I probably won't see anybody after tonight. Okay. Have a good day.